Good evening. Welcome to the Half Moon Bay Planning Commission on March 26, 2019. We'll open it up here and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Pogar? Here. Commissioner Reddick? Here. Commissioner Hernandez? I am present. Vice Chair Benjamin? Here. And Chair Holt? Here. All commissioners are present. Okay, moving on to the approval of minutes. We have minutes from March 12th, 2019. Is there any comments, changes, or motions? Move to approve the minutes as presented. 
Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's approved. Okay, moving into the uh, public comment period. This is the time of the meeting where uh, the public can make comments on items not on the agenda. I do have one speaker's card uh, for the public forum, and this is Julie Andriotti McGowan. You just need to push the ad button. Yeah, just once. Huh? Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners, Planning Commissioners. This evening I come to address you as something was brought to my, to my attention which really upset me. I want to go on record that when you do the land use plan that Stone Pine Center, which was Formerly, the Andriotti property stays in the name of the Andriotti property. I will give you reasons why. It, it started in 1943. My grandfather, an immigrant from Italy, had the opportunity to buy a piece of property and in that same area, which currently is stone pine and et cetera. He bought it from the Azevedos in good faith, and later, my father, Aldo Andriotti, his son, would join him in the, in, the, in the business. Later on, my mother would join as, he, as my dad married my mom, and they became partners. But the property still was in my grandfather's name up until 1954, after his death, after the probate. Prior to after that, <clears throat> Let's see. My parents continued to farm artichokes, and later on, my dad, when he was ready to retire, decided that pumpkins was his, going to be his thing because he loved children, and children was his life, and he had two grandchildren. And for this reason, this is why he grew the pumpkins. On the property, there were three houses. There were two houses. One was directly almost on the bridge, one in the middle, and one two-story house, which you will not see again. The, all three homes are gone. There was one big, one big barn, and that was, the, the, well, the height of our activity. When my parents decided to sell the property because they could no longer hold on to it, the purchasers asked my father, do you want to name it after, your, after you? And my dad said, no. I want to name it after my grandchildren. And that Aaron Lane is named after my, grand, after my daughter, Aaron McGowan Brazil. And Patrick Way is named after my son, Patrick J. McGowan, who at one time worked for the city of Half Moon Bay. I want you to consider that this is, very, this is part of my heritage, my history, and I still live in this town, and I do walk that area. And I want you to know one thing. My dad was a, a, the best steward of that land. He took good care of that land. He never let anything happen. The creek was always pristine. Fish could run in the creek. I could see from if, if I was on the bottom flat where it is now Carter Park, I could see underneath the bridge and beyond. It was just beautiful. And that's all I have to say. Thank I you very much. Thanks for your comments. appreciate the history, and, and I know this was discussed at one point during the, the last time we considered the land use plan, and I think we'll, I imagine we'll be discussing it again. So thank you very much. Um, I have no other speaker cards for the public uh, comment period. Um, not seeing anybody jumping up. We'll close that. Close, close the uh, public comment period and move on to our first public hearing item uh, for a coastal development permit for the Ocean Colony Pump Station and Force Main Sewer Replacement Project. Okay. Uh, we have here tonight the Ocean Colony Pump Station Rehabilitation and Force Main Replacement Project. The project design engineers are Schaffen Wheeler from Santa Rosa 
and the project biologists are WRA from San Rafael. The project is what the name implies. It's a sewer pump station rehabilitation and the replacement of the force main pipe that discharges from the pump station. Uh, the location is the Ocean Colony subdivision and the Half Moon Bay Golf Links in South Half Moon Bay. On this plot, you can see here uh, Highway 1 and Redondo Beach Road. Uh, this is Fairway Drive here, and the pump station is located here. Um, the force main is seen in red, and it goes along Fairway Drive and goes to the north here. It ultimately discharges into a manhole, um, and from here, the sewage effluent flows by gravity to the north to the SAM treatment plant in the north. This plat was taken from the city sanitary sewer master plan that was developed in 2016. And um, one element of the master plan was to develop and calculate the pumping capacity requirements for the pump station. So the State Water Resources Control Board requires that a sewer pump station uh, have the capacity to pump sewerage under maximum flow conditions. And not only that, that it can pump maximum flow conditions with one, the largest pump out of service. So maximum flow conditions are called peak wet weather flow. And pumping with the largest pump out of service is called firm capacity. So the peak wet weather flow at Ocean Colony uh, pump station is 950 gallons per minute. There are two existing pumps in the Ocean Colony pump station. They each pump 650 gallons per minute. So that means that um, with one pump out of service, the existing firm capacity is 650 gallons per minute. So indeed, we do see that during peak wet weather events at the Ocean Colony pump station, both existing pumps need to operate to um, to pump the uh, peak wet weather flows. So indeed, this pump station does not meet firm capacity requirements. So the purpose of this project, essentially, is to rehabilitate the pump station so that we can comply with firm capacity requirements. And again, firm capacity is the capacity that is available with the largest pump out of service. Can I do something with this? Does that make this? Okay. So secondarily, we'd um, like to rep replace the existing discharge force main. The existing force main is uh, 50 years old. It's reached its service life. And it also um, travels through an ISHA um, area that we would like to um, replace the new pipe outside of that Isha area. So let's get a closer view of the project, somewhat closer. Um, this is the golf links, whoops, sorry. So this is the um, pump station here along Fairway Drive. The westerly entrance to Ocean Colony subdivision gate is here. The Ritz is kind of over here. Uh, this is Fairway Drive. And uh, here's Redondo Beach Road up here, the terminus of the project. Um, the pump station stays in its location, but the footprint will be slightly expanded. And the new force main follows essentially the old force main alignment except for a couple of differences. Here along Fairway Drive, the existing force main um, is just south of Fairway Drive pavement and it actually sits in private landscaping of these homes here. So the new force main alignment is going to be a little bit to the north of the existing alignment. It's going to be in the pavement. So we, we won't be in private landscaping. Um, the new alignment will follow the old alignment location as it crosses the golf course fairways here. 
And uh, after it crosses the fairways, the new alignment will jog over to the east a little bit here, whereas the old alignment of the force main continues northerly through this area here, which is an Isha area um, that um, we're going to try to avoid. So let's look at photos that kind of show what I've just described. Here's the um, pump station, the existing pump station, and the new force main is going to come out of the pump station and then head easterly under pavement along Fairway Drive. It's going to go along Fairway Drive for about 1,200 feet where it um, gets to about here, and then it shoots north across the fairways, as you saw in those previous photos previous photos. So after it crosses the fairways, and so now we're looking to the south, after it crosses the fairways, the existing force main continues on through Isha, as we saw, and the proposed force main jogs over here to the east to avoid the Isha area. So this is, a, um, over here, there's a, a man-made irrigation pond. And from that pond there are two culverts that discharge over to here, outside <laughs> the frame. Um, so the new force main is going to be above those existing culverts, but underneath the golf cart path. Because of the proximity of this area to Isha, uh, there are a number of standard BMPs that are shown on the plans that are going to be uh, enlisted in this area. There's going to be a silt fence uh, along this west side of the um, golf cart path. Uh, there's going to be um, an exclusionary, an exclusion fence um, over on this side. Um, as well as on this side, so that no California red-legged frog or San Francisco garter snake can, you know, potentially enter the area. Um, and these are just standard BMPs that we've incorporated into the project. Doug will um, address that a little bit later. So, um, again, as we move further to the north, um, the alignment heads northerly towards the maintenance yard back here. Um, there's a chain link fence that runs along here that you can't see because it's covered in vines and um, ornamental landscaping. Uh, while we build the force main in this area here, we propose to detour this golf cart uh, traffic uh, just a little to the east here and um, separate the construction area um, from the golf cart traffic um, that would be rerouted right through here. Though we were proposing a chain link, uh, slatted chain link fence through here um, to separate the golf cart traffic from the construction. Now I want to go back and look at this slide one more time. A further um, condition of the project is that um, within 10 feet of this sort of bank area, all work here, demolition work, um, needs to be constructed by hand. There'll be no mechanized equipment in this area. So, um, uh, of course, the trenching is further than, it's 20 feet away from this area here. But any area within 10 feet of the bank will be um, hand work as a condition of the project. So here the force main continues through the maintenance yard. And then from the maintenance yard here, it uh, arrives at uh, Redondo Beach Road, where the force main um, connects to the gravity manhole that we talked about earlier. From there, it goes to the treatment plant by gravity. So the existing force main will be left in place and it will be filled with um, flowable concrete or with sand. So let's look briefly at the pump station. Um, the pump station, um, in addition to new pumps that meet firm capacity, the pumps are in the wet well here, 
In addition to the new pumps, we're getting a new generator. Uh, the generator will be enclosed in a level two sound enclosure. The existing generator at the pump station has no sound enclosure. So this will be a big um, upgrade uh, with the sound enclosure around the generator. We're getting a new electrical panel here with all of the compliance setbacks um, from the other pieces of equipment, new electrical equipment in the panel. Um, we're going to reline the wet well. The wet well size stays the same. It's just going to be realigned with a, a very strong um, grout material. And then also um, in this vault here will be a, another connection so that yet another pump um, brought in on a back of a truck or whatever can um, connect to the force main through a bypass valve connection in this vault here. So uh, the footprint is expanding. Um, the existing fence around the pump station is right about here. So the footprint's expanding about 340 square feet in the easterly direction. So to accommodate for that, a few, um, you know, the smaller Monterey Cypress will be removed. This will be new pump station and then um, new screening landscaping, Monterey Cypress, et cetera, will be planted around the pump station on this east side. The um, existing landscaping that's on the south and um, west side, the east and west side, the west and south sides, this side and that side of the pump station, that landscaping is going to remain in place. It's a bunch of big Monterey cypress and um, that screens the pump station. So we'll only be removing some of the vegetation on this side. So we do have a tentative construction schedule. We'd like to uh, request for bids uh, on this project in May of this year, and we'd like to award the contract um, oh, in July 2019. Um, given that um, schedule, we'd like to begin work. We propose to begin work uh, in November of 2019. Uh, we'll begin the trenching portion of the project first. We expect the trenching portion to be completed by uh, February, and the pump station then will um, uh, work will begin. Uh, we anticipate that all of this work could be complete um, by July 2020. We have had uh, public outreach. We have, um, for many months, been in communication with the Ocean Colony Homeowners Association and the Half Moon Bay uh, Golf Links. Um, we have regu regularly scheduled monthly meetings with them, and we uh, continue, we anticipate to continue those monthly meetings um, up until construction and through construction, as well as weekly construction meetings um, to be held with the um, construction supervisors. So um, we're also in discussion with the Ocean Colony Partners, LLC, for uh, easement acquisition through their maintenance yard. Um, and we continue those discussions today. Um, as we speak about this project. Uh, we do plan to have a presentation to the Ocean Colony homeowners. Um, I think that's in May. Um, and uh, as, the project, as the project moves forward and we have more details about the project, we'll continue our, and expand our public outreach to the Ritz, Carlton, and other uh, people who might be affected by the construction. So, um, I'm going to pass it over to Doug, who can talk now, speak now about the permitting for the project. One here. Uh, we did prepare a biological resource evaluation uh, that was finalized in, I believe, May of 2018. Um, that was circulated as required under um, city policies and regulations for 45 days to all the resource agencies, including the Coastal Commission. Uh, the only comments we received were from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, their comments were fairly generic and 
for the most part didn't apply to this project. Um, so as far as the permitting, the, the BRE was the foundation. The, that was one of the first steps was to figure out what the baseline conditions were. Uh, it has some effect on what permits would be required, what level of environmental review would be appropriate and to a certain extent the final alignment of the project. And so based on that study, which has been on the city's website since May of last year, uh, and we've gotten no, res no comments on it during that period, um, they looked at a very broad area. Uh, the study area extends well to the west, um, outside of the golf course area, uh, into that uh, wooded area. It extends north of Redondo Beach Road into an area that has some isolated wetlands. Um, and so it covered a fairly broad area. And the basic conclusions were that this was a, the best alternative in that it avoided uh, the area, the environmentally sensitive habitat area where the existing pipeline passes underneath the perennial stream and two intermittent streams and through the mature eucalyptus woodlands um, that would be relocated to an area that's basically paved over either by um, fairway drive, the golf cart path, or the access into the maintenance yard uh, and across the regularly maintained golf course grass. And it's a bit of a paper chase figuring out Sometimes if permits require a coastal development permit or if they're exempt, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail, but we did quite a bit of work. And the, in the, the memorandum that we sent to the Planning Commission responding to some questions, uh, it notes that um, you go to one section of the code, it refers you to three or four other sections. You go there, it refers you to three or four other sections. The, the short story was the, the project qualified as exempt from a permit requirement, although based on one exemption, which it requires that mechanized equipment be at least 20 feet away from coastal waters, including streams, the, the margin was pretty small. Um, there's another document published by the, adopted by the Coastal Commission in 1978 that says that it's exempt. So we had sort of a, a belt and suspenders approach, but then we started thinking about construction contingencies. Maybe we have to remove all of that asphalt. Then we're within 20 feet. So we just decided as a matter of good government that we should just apply for the coastal development permit. To, we don't treat ourselves differently than anybody else. Um, so that's, there were some questions about why if it's exempt we're actually applying for a coastal development permit, and, and that's the short answer. As far as other permits uh, that could be required from the state and the federal government, um, we did get a couple of questions from the Planning Commission about uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, there's a section in the staff report where we, we note that there will be no fill or dredging in Corps of Engineers jurisdictional waters. And that part of the report was in response to the comment letter we got from the Corps of Engineers, and it was just clarifying that um, that letter had, it wasn't project specific. It noted that under certain conditions, this project could be required to get a Section 404 permit. And, and I was just noting that we don't, it's not required because we're not filling or dredging to jurisdictional waters or any other waters for that matter. Uh, California Fish and Wildlife Service, similarly, if you're affecting doing work in a stream, and they, they define that broadly, including the riparian area adjacent to it, you have to get a, uh, a 1602 agreement. In this case, the area where we're working, there is no riparian vegetation. It's well above the top of bank, um, so it, it does not require uh, a 1602 agreement. Uh, we are required to comply with basic stormwater uh, erosion requirements under the MPDES permit, uh, and this project does include all the 
standard best management practices to make sure there's no uh, untreated stormwater runoff or erosion. From a CEQA standpoint, um, we determined it's categorically exempt. Uh, it's based on substantial evidence. In this case, there are four categorical exemptions that it falls under. Um, the BRE provides important evidence to support that conclusion. And also, um, when you consider uh, the impacts that are avoided by relocating the pipeline to an area that's not within ESHA, um, replacing the older pumps with uh, more efficient ones that could save up to 50% energy, uh, bringing in a new emergency generator that meets all current air district requirements, uh, the project uh, on that would be a beneficial effect as opposed to a, a negative effect is, is our position. So from a permitting standpoint, uh, we have pretty extensive findings in the staff report as well as the resolution showing that the project conforms to the coastal land use plan, the general plan, the zoning ordinance. Uh, I'll let Denise kind of follow up with what the next steps are and that will conclude our presentation. Uh, so uh, upon approval of the coastal development permit, um, the, our design engineers will continue to final design for the project and we will um, go ahead and go out to bid. Um, we'll continue to work on securing the uh, easements that are required for the project. Um, we will award the contract and um, continue to expand our public outreach as we get closer to the actual construction. Uh, then our job moves into construction management and completion of the project. Great, we welcome you. any questions that you might have uh, for Doug and I. Thank you very much. Jill? I just wanted to make a, a little note tonight and uh, thank Denise Hutton for this presentation. The city engineer was not able to be here tonight. He would have introduced the item and, and one of the key um, components of this project is that this is a project about reliability and not capacity. Uh, we also wanted to note that there's a uh, multiple page, it's about five pages of uh, responses that uh, Denise and Doug um, prepared in response to uh, some really excellent uh, questions and uh, topics that were brought up by the Planning Commission and that's back on the table if anyone uh, wanted to get that additional information and that's that's all I have thank you great thank you very much um, so with that yeah we can uh, address any clarifying commission or questions from the Commission I do want to appreciate um, commissioners for submitting comments to staff ahead of time I think it helps move the meeting along to, to be able to get those responses in writing ahead of time. And I know we have a fairly meaty item um, later on the agenda, so um, so it's helpful to get those questions answered ahead of time. So with that, any additional clarifying questions? Commissioner Reddick. Thank you. Um, did, I, did I understand that in addition to the, the new force main that will run north-south and will be east of the, the existing force main, which will be abandoned and filled with concrete or sand. That we also intend to abandon the existing force main uh, south of Fairway Drive? The entire length of the force main will be abandoned. S so it will, the entire length of the force main will be left in place and filled with uh, concrete or sand. OK. So it's not just that north-south segment. No. The full length. Commissioner Hernandez. Uh, thank you. Um, so I appreciate the city taking the more conservative approach with the CDP. Uh, just a question: the generator that's there, that's an emergency generator, I presume. Uh, well, yes, it's for emergencies, but it's a permanently installed generator uh, for power outages. And what type mm -hmm. of fuel does it use? Uh, it's a diesel, as is the new one. And um, just a question of wh where is the diesel fuel stored and in what way? Uh, not on site. Uh, we have um, maintenance personnel who visit the uh, pump station weekly and start the generator up just to make sure that it's operational. 
um, they watch the fuel levels. Um, and so they would be the ones to. There's no excess fuel stored on site. Excess fuel would be stored off site. No. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Benjamin. Yeah, so just following on his question, so I, I was, I had been laboring under the concept that maybe if there was a power failure that the diesel generator would kick on automatically, that there, and that would be hard to do if there was no fuel on site. So I'm just trying to figure out whether I understood the question correctly. Uh, oh, I, maybe I didn't understand the question correctly. There's no additional fuel tanks other than the internal tank of the generator. Okay, I see. It's all self-contained. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, some, and uh, another question. Uh, you mentioned that we're still in the process of getting the, um, uh, the, the encroachment easements. Correct. And is that, do we norm, I, I don't do these things. Do we normally get those before they come to us? Or if it didn't work out, would that present a problem where you'd need to come back to us for a different alignment? How, how does that go? Uh, well, I don't know what the, I, I don't know how this might differ from any other standard, but um, if we get the easement and we don't have a CDP, we can't use the easement. So we're just trying to, you know, um, facilitate the process by getting the CDP um, in advance. And the, um uh, the generator sounds like it's a bigger generator, um, but it's, I, I gathered that we're putting a, a box around it that's going to make it quieter. Did I understand that correctly from the, the pitch? Uh, where did you call it a level two or a type two? Or The generator isn't necessarily larger. The um, generator needs to be able to run <coughs> both pumps. And the power draw, uh, the old pumps are 47 horsepower, the new pumps are 35 horsepower. I see. So the generator actually isn't sized larger because the power draw is less. Right, and uh, with respect to the, the sound power levels that the house nearby would experience, I gather that the housing around the generator is reducing the sound pressure levels that they're going to experience when the generator kicks on? Absolutely. There are. Um, two or three levels of sound enclosures for generators. Uh, the second level, level two, is the most efficient sound attenuating enclosure. And that's the enclosure that we are specking out for this project, Great. is a level two sound enclosure. Thank you. No further questions. I'd like to hear from the public, though, after Commissioner Polgar. I don't have additional questions, but I do appreciate the um, memo addressing the questions I raised earlier. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with that, we can open up the, the public uh, comment. I have one speaker card on this item, uh, Mr. Bruce Russell. Is that on? Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me okay? Thank you. Uh, I'm here uh, representing Ocean Colony Partners in the golf course. And first of all, I'd like to really commend the staff for suggesting about a year ago that we move out of the environmentally sensitive area and we move underneath the golf path and through our maintenance yard. And for the last year, we have uh, worked really cooperatively with the staff because we share that view that uh, the new forest paint ought to be underneath a path and underneath asphalt instead of in the middle of a uh, intermittent stream, by the way, not a perennial stream. Just want to clarify that. Um, we're also really hopeful that we can work out after uh, the permit is granted, assuming it's granted, the, uh, uh, the terms of easement agreements and construction access agreements and all the legal stuff that goes along with agreeing in perpetuity to let somebody put uh, pipes across your property and right through the middle of an operating golf course and a uh, maintenance yard that's really critical to the golf course. We have not worked out these terms yet. We have conceptual understandings about some things but uh, we are confident that we'll be able uh, to work those things out consistent with the conditions of approval and we won't have to come back. What I would like to comment on though, if I have just a couple more minutes, is uh, there were some questions about some of the environmental consequences of this and uh, the setting. Um, I've had now had the occasion to read the uh, Wetlands Research Associates report and 
I, I think I, I'm glad to be able to say that the biological condition in the study area and affecting any of the work areas is actually much more favorable than that report. And the reason why I say that is because we have done an enormous amount of biological analysis of the ponds, this area. We built a 32-unit subdivision there, Carnoustie, which was the topic of a 200-page EIR and three biological reports. We have uh, recently, in 2008, as part of the Recycle Water Project that was uh, proposed, we did further analysis by the same firm of the biological condition in the, in the, in the pond uh, that's referred to. And so I, just, I would just like to take a moment to correct a few things because if people have ongoing concerns about impacts to potential uh, frog habitat or frogs or snakes, I, wa I want to kind of set the record straight. Um, there have been several biological uh, studies of this pond, the 15th hole pond, including a recent study by the city's biologist, Terry Huffman, doing the LCP update. Nobody has ever suggested that this is habitat for frogs. There is no vegetation there. This is an irrigation sedimentation basin, man-made. Uh, there are no reeds. There's no cattails. There's zero vegetation in that pond. Um, and no, no other biologist has ever suggested, as this report suggests, that there's a high likelihood that there's frog habitat in, or frogs using that pond or that there's upland dispersal. I don't know um, why Wetlands Research made this conclusion because they've issued two other reports prior to this one coming to exactly the opposite conclusion. Um, the second thing is there are no perennial streams anywhere in this area despite the suggestion in figure three. All of the streams there are intermittent. Um, people can look at a map or governmental uh, studies from 30 years ago and see a stream before Ocean Colony was built. But I live there and work there every day. Um, all of those streams don't have water three to six months a year, not a drop of water. And so they're not perennial streams. So the setback areas and the possibility of impact is much less than suggested here. Uh, the stream alignment is also different than in this report, and the recent reports for the city and their LCP amendment show a different alignment. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is not, that pond is not habitat for, for the red-legged frog, but probably the biggest reason is, is that not only is there no uh, breeding habitat, but there's also water fluctuation almost all year long. That is an irrigation pond that goes up, comes down, goes up, goes down. And the pond is filled with bullfrogs. We didn't put them there, but they keep me up every night. Um, so there are no perennial streams that connect to two different water bodies and create a corridor for habitat. There is no connection between two ponds and that golf course, any stream whatsoever. Um, and so I, I just thought that it was important to also note that the vast majority of this project, as it goes beyond that one area where there uh, is, where it's closest to uh, the Esha, the, the intermittent stream. The rest of this project as it goes along north to south is not four to six feet away from the top of any bank. It is a good 10 to 20 feet away from any bank. And so I, I just, I wanted to clear up the record here in terms of some of the questions that were asked and how significant, you know, uh, this project might be or what impact it might have on biological resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is the only speaker card I have. Uh, if anybody else wishes to speak, you need to jump up now. Not seeing that. Close the public comment period and we'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. Um, any comments or discussion from the commission or motion? Um, I, I really appreciate the uh, uh, I appreciate the speaker comments, and I understand staff's perspective about not wanting to uh, put the easement cart before the CDP horse. I, you know, it's hard to tell which one's the horse or the cart here, but I, I can see both points of view. It sounds like there would be a concern if the report was saying that the habitat was less significant and someone was concerned that inadequate protections were not being provided. In this case, the worst case is that we're overprotecting, and so I'm not worried about the legal adequacy of protections, so I, I appreciate that. The sound stuff is great. I, have, uh, I asked some questions in my note about uh, whether we were increasing 
um, infrastructure in a way that could be growth inducing. And uh, on reflection, uh, after hearing the staff response, I thought it was, it was very compelling. And I think that there is a need to manage sewer infrastructure, but the quantum at which we need the management is at a much higher level than just this force main. There's a need to understand our capacity for each of our utilities with respect to their growth inducing potential. Um, and so I just realized that this was not the right framework, this one force main, for thinking about that problem. And I certainly would like to see uh, a, a minimized risk of um, a sewage problem in that area, as would the Regional Water Quality Control Board. So I am going to be supporting this project. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Wolgar, any comments? Um, yes, uh, I, again, I wanted to thank you for the responses on the, the comments, and actually the, the ones that I raised with respect to the, um, the, the, the stream and the, the top of bank, and, the, and I appreciate your, your responses on that. It was more just to ensure that um, we weren't involving it, involved it doing any work in that area be, in terms of making sure that because it was specified for Army Corps jurisdiction, I wanted to make sure for state waters jurisdiction and those permitting. And I think I appreciate the responses to address that. Um, and I, too, uh, am supportive of this project. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Commissioner Reddick. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank staff again for answers to my questions by email last week. I, I understand the, it was puzzling to me at first to envision the uh, existing force main being filled with uh, concrete <laughs> for such a distance, but I understand the reasoning for that. You don't want that to, in the future, collapse and, and damage environmentally sens sensitive habitat. So I understand that that is, in, in this case, best practices. So yes, I, I uh, don't have any other issues with this project. Commissioner Hernandez. Uh, I support the project just to um, reflect the applicant's comments regarding the, um, the wildlife study. I'd just like to make sure that we amend the study with those comments annotated in the record. Uh, so if this document's referenced in the future, it cross-references the other wildlife studies that were referenced by the applicant. Um, and through the chair, there was one other little thing. I, you know, I know that the conditions for construction or the conditions of approval, you know, we have some that are tailored and we have some that are boilerplate. And one of our boilerplate conditions is that we ask the applicant to indemnify us if there's a problem. In this case, the city is the applicant. So is that what we want to say? Do we want to say we're going to indemnify us or is there somebody else we should be asking to indemnify us or do you not care? Hi, Winter. Um, I think there's no harm done either. I think there's no harm done either way. So leaving the condition in. If we hurt ourselves, by yourselves, we'll fix it. Yes. Okay. I'm covered okay. indemnification twice in one week. Goodness. Move to approve. With. Uh, okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? From Commissioner Hernandez. I have a. Uh, I'm second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, project passes. Moving on to our next. Uh, Planning Commission business uh, study session of the draft local coastal land use plan and uh, receive a presentation from a uh, special guest, uh, Dr. Ann Reddy. Staff is happy to be back tonight with another study session on our local coastal land use plan update. And I'm just going to introduce the item as a whole, and then we will get uh, quickly to our guest speaker. Um, again, this is a study session, not a decision-making meeting. Uh, we're going to continue to pay attention to potential conflicts of interest that individual commissioners may have. 
uh, commissioners may uh, oversee general plan and local coastal program updates, but when it comes to matters concerning specific parcels on maps, individual commissioners may need to recuse themselves. Following public comments, when this, this item comes back to the commission for discussion, uh, we request that individual commissioners acknowledge if you're going to bring up any particular site. The reason why we're reading this out now is we're not sure if um, the guest uh, speaker's presentation may um, lead to any discussion like that, and uh, so so this is all part of that framework. If that is the case, um, let's make sure to give our commissioners a chance to excuse themselves for those portions of the discussion. And uh, I'd like to uh, go ahead and uh, just note that our overview tonight is going to follow the same format that you're used to. We will have a presentation after the guest speaker, but there'll be time for you to um, engage in uh, Q&A with her. And then um, we're going to get back to our, our study session context, um, clar uh, taking clarifying questions, public uh, forum, and uh, discussion with the Planning Commission, and we'll end with next steps. Now, I'd like to turn it back to the chair, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Yes, do we have a special speaker for us tonight? Uh, Dr. Ann Riley um, is going to be uh, presenting to us on restoring streams in difficult urban locations. Uh, Dr. Riley has been working in watershed planning, hydrology, and stream science and restoration for over 40 years in the public and private sectors, currently serves on the board of the California Watershed Network. She has planned, constructed, and funded stream restoration projects as executive director of the Waterways Wet Restoration Institute in California, organized the first conference of the Coalition to Restore Urban Waters in 1993, and began a program in the California Department of Water Resources in 1984 that continues to provide grants to support urban stream restoration. Awards recognizing her work include an American Rivers Award in 1993 for her leadership in establishing the National Urban River Movement, the California Governor's Environmental and Economic Leadership Award in 2003, and the Salmonid Restoration Federation Restorationist of the Year Award in 2004. Uh, so tonight's presentation is about restoring streams in urban settings, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Ann Riley. Thank you for being here tonight. Hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be in Half Moon Bay. Uh, what we're going to discuss tonight is um, other communities who have been involved in restoring streams, uh, but they're in much more difficult situations than you have here in the Half Moon Bay. I am impressed with the amount of space you have uh, around your, your drainages, and they are drainages and ditches. Uh, but I, I want to give you a window on what the possibilities are for places like Kehoe Creek, uh, Pullman. Uh, I saw Seymour today. Um, and the, the other uh, uh, point I, I'm, I'm really going to drive home is that the communities who are involved in these projects have much fewer resources than you do. Uh, many of them are poverty. Uh, they're state-defined as disadvantaged communities. Um, but uh, we have a, uh, a wonderful array of s uh, stream restoration grant programs located in four different state agencies uh, that the communities are using to fund these projects. So let's, let's launch into this. Um, this is a, uh, a flash back into history, 1969. <laughs> and uh, we're on Cornamadera Creek in Marin County. Uh, Barbara Boxer got her start in politics by throwing herself in front of U.S. Army Corps of Engineer bulldozers uh, and excavators uh, to stop the uh, concrete lining and channelization of the Corte Madera Creek system. And in fact, what ended up happening, uh, some of it was channelized and they stopped the rest of the project. Um, but this was a uh, flood control project that was supposed to provide one in 100 year, or actually one in 200 year flood protection. And in the end, it only provided protection for the 15 year flood. And I'm making this point because engineering has evolved uh, in a very profound way since the 60s. And we understand that ditching waterways, lining them with rock, gabions, concrete, uh, has real performance issues. Um, so let, let's go on. We're going to go across the bay to Richmond. 
a very different kind of community from wealthy white Bruin County. Um, this is Lily Mae Jones. Uh, she's on the banks of Wildcat Creek. And in the early 80s, this community stopped a, con a conventional traditional Army Corps of Engineer flood control project um, and designed a flood control project based on uh, natural processes of streams. It became a national model. Uh, in fact, it informed the rewriting of engineering manuals in the 2000s. Um, here's an example of a absolutely impoverished community who got a, a restoration alternative for handling flooding problems. Um, they could not have afforded to put in this innovative flood control project or any flood control project at all without the state grants. And in the state grant programs, they want to see restoration features. So uh, the irony is the only kind of project they could afford was a restoration project, not a conventional engineering project. And um, the, so I, I encourage you just from the point of view of bringing in money to your community uh, from these state agencies that you look at these restoration approaches. Um, here's a very unlikely project as well. Uh, here's a, um, uh, a village in Albany. It uh, was settled during World War II with people working in the shipyards and in the military. And there is a creek under that street. Um, as a matter of fact, that street is somewhat famous because it's called Riley Street. <laughs> but this is what this street looks like. Whoops, sorry. Um, back in uh, 1989, uh, the University of California needed a mitigation project for their development of this area. They took down the old World War II housing. Um, and as uh, the mitigation that was accepted by the resources agencies was to daylight that creek that was underground in the culvert. Um, they only, we only had about 30 feet of right of way. I asked for an extra six feet. And when I say I am representing uh, the nonprofit organizations I've worked with who uh, have designed and constructed these projects over time. And you'll see here after digging up the culvert, um, there's a lot of sinuosity or it's meandering a lot uh, because we're on a very flat valley. It's just before entering San Francisco Bay. And those funny looking sticks in the ground are limbs cut off of willows uh, that are going to turn into instant trees. Let me take you into the next shot that's about two years later. Um, so these projects can be done very economically. I know that at one point um, the city had an estimate of restoration project on Kehoe Channel um, around six or seven million dollars. And in fact, um, this book that some of you may have looked at on the table over here um, looked at well, about 15 to 20 projects around the Bay Area and came up with an average cost for those projects. And that's about $1,300 to $1,500 a lineal foot. So, uh, you know, restoring Kehoe Creek, for example, might cost $1.5 to $2 million. So I, uh, I hope you look at a realistic range of costs for doing these kinds of projects. Um, that's what that creek looks like today. It's a wonderful amenity for a very dense uh, urban situation. Um, you can see in this slide that you've got housing and an elementary school right up to that creek quarter. And it handles the one in 100 year flood. Um, you are lucky, when I look at your landscape here, you have a lot of room to work in. I'm showing you these really impossible, very dense situations. And uh, you have much easier opportunities here to deal with your waterways. I'm moving up to the city of Napa. Uh, this is a portion of creek that was covered up with a big metal lid. Um, the city of Napa voted in the 70s uh, to pick up that lid, uh, daylight the creek and the downtown area as a way of bringing back the business district uh, to revive people visiting there to go shopping. 
Um, the uh, project involved a very architectural plaza. People loved it. They went shopping at the Murphy's <laughs> store next door. They visited this area. And by the uh, 2000s, understood that the architectural treatment of this plaza next to the creek, uh, you see those, uh, is there a pointer on here? Yeah, this green jobby, okay. Uh, these, these guys here, these concrete supports for the plaza were blocking the flow of the water and creating backwaters and flooding into town. So the next generation of restoration was to take all that out and use what we call soil bioengineering, uh, which I'll get into a little more explanation in photographs, which is a bundling of plants that uh, the root systems are so intense that they handle very high shear stresses. Uh, and uh, the engineering manuals of the Army Corps in the 2000s and the Natural Resources Conservation Service has now adopted these soil bioengineering plant systems as more effective stream bank erosion control mechanisms. Um, here we've got, uh, I'm gonna move to Napa Creek where um, uh, you've got this kind of situations with houses ready to fall into the creek. Um, the community got together and decided that uh, rather than flood, rather than have their houses fall in the creek, uh, they, there was nine households willing to be bought out and relocated by FEMA. Um, that's a, that is an unusual situation. Most of the projects I'm going to be discussing tonight did involve any relocations. Um, so, but there are times when you can get community support to move things. Um, so don't be afraid of that. And, and the FEMA uh, has money to help communities do that. Um, this is uh, uh, steelhead fish. <laughs> Woody Debris put in that new Army Corps flood control channel. This is an Army Corps project. Um, it provides 100-year flood protection. Um, look at all the habitat along with the flood control protection. And guess who showed up? <laughs> so we, we actually have beavers in downtown Napa. This is a very popular project. Uh, people in cities love to see wildlife right where they're living. Um, and this book about neighborhood stream restoration discusses a case in Martinez where uh, beaver moved in to Alhambra Creek. There was a great deal of concern about whether the beaver dams would create flooding. Uh, fish and game was brought in to shoot the beaver. Um, they used a beaver expert from Vermont and put in a caster master, which uh, fools the beaver uh, into thinking that uh, they don't need to build their dam as high as they would like to. Um, that took care of the worry about the water surface elevation going up during the 10-year flood. And so the beaver happily live in uh, Alhambra Creek. There's now a beaver festival uh, I get on Amtrak and I go to <laughs> Martinez and go spend my bucks in downtown uh, Martinez businesses. Um, and you'll note this, this business uh, link to these projects um, where the, the business community understands that the environmental enhancements uh, bring an identity to the downtowns into the communities and that's a good thing. Uh, the mayor of uh, Martinez proudly states that they are the only city in the United States where they have beaver living 15 feet from parking meters. I'm bringing you back to the Napa River right now, and uh, this is a big old ugly uh, historic building on that river. And uh, the contract that I worked off of to help with the Napa River restoration project was with the Napa, Napa Valley uh, Redevelopment Corporation. Again, that business community stepping in and wanting to restore the Napa River 
uh, to restore the economy of the city of Napa. Um, and in this case, uh, the canoe we were in was right here. Um, buildings were moved out of the Napa River to uh, make way for the floods. Again, that, that can happen. It doesn't have to happen. But what was key was these original bridges crossing the Napa River were too low, and the floodwaters were backing up behind them. And so what we now know is if you're having flooding issues, the best thing to do is look for the hydraulic constrictions in your communities. And what I mean by hydraulic constrictions are railroad trussels, bridges, culverts that are too small. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask all of you to say hydraulic constrictions. Right, one, two, three, hydraulic constrictions. So if you remember anything from this talk, you're gonna remember that. Uh, rather than going in and straightening out streams, lining them in rock, lining them in concrete, um, what you need to do is look at your culverts and bridges and trestles and put your money there to go to the source of the problems. Okay, so. Um, that's what Napa did. They, they removed and rebuilt uh, oh, up to like six bridges. Um, again, how did they afford that? They cost shared with the California Department of Transportation. California Department of Transportation gets federal funds. Um, and they also had the Coastal Conservancy involved, the California Department of Water Resources Ur Urban Stream Restoration prog Program involved, the Natural Resources uh, river Parkway programs, the Wildlife Conservation Board. Uh, we have these riches in California and state grant programs. And the way cities are able to afford these big public works projects with restoration features is by plugging into these state grant programs. Okay, uh, that's what the Napa River used to look like. Uh, in the downtown area. This is what it looks like today. Um, it has pulled in uh, a new downtown that was redeveloped. That was where that ugly concrete building was that we were looking at from the canoe. And this has become so successful for rejuvenating the economy in downtown Napa that uh, Hotels came in and dropped $300 million in the first two or three years. Um, all kinds of grumbling about too many tourists in downtown Napa now. <laughs> so I guess beware. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the, the point being is, is uh, these river and stream restoration projects are city and neighborhood restoration projects. Uh, I'm going down to San Luis Obispo Creek. Um, it was turned into a trapezoidal flood control channel uh, probably in the 50s or 60s. Um, the downtown business area was going into decay. Um, uh, the merchants were wondering, how do we get people back? Uh, they decided that, well, we'll try to enhance San Luis Obispo Creek. This was in the 70s. Um, and it started out very architecturally, you know, you've got the WPA uh, walls, you've got some trees, you've got some boulders. Um, as time moved on, uh, it became greener and greener. Uh, trails were put along it. They faced their businesses toward the creek. And it is a very thriving commercial district today. How many people have been to downtown San Luis Obispo? Anybody from this? It's a lot of fun. It's beautiful. Um, and it was a really good business call. As you move further downstream, as the projects mature, you see that they're using these heavily vegetated means of restoring the banks and holding the banks and preventing uh, bank erosion. And one of my favorite stories is eating in this Italian restaurant up here. Um, and having a big commotion in the creek right down here. <laughs> and we look down and there is a uh, night heron 
having a big fight with a steelhead that's moving up the creek. Um, and we were all taking bets who's going to win the night here and the steelhead. And the steelhead won. I was kind of happy. Uh, <laughs> but what a, what a great experience to have in the middle of a city. Um, so one of the things they did was um, in some areas where flooding was a concern, they built these very attractive WPA flood walls. Um, and they didn't wall people off from the creek. Uh, there's still a lot of public interaction with the creek, but there's a lot of different creative ways of handling flooding. Um, uh, landscape berms uh, around buildings, uh, flood walls like this, uh, if you need to do that. I'm bouncing into the city of Berkeley and Albany again. And uh, the University of California wanted to do a large redevelopment housing project. Um, so here was their plan. Um, and they said, all right, we're just going to have to turn Cordonesis Creek, which is a ditch. I'll show you a photo of that ditch. Um, into a standard uh, trapezoidal flood control project, because that's all we have the room for. And so we looked at how could we have a stable creek with the right size floodplain to hold the 100 year flood and the kind of meander we needed so that the creek wouldn't excessively erode. Um, here's what this creek looked like. Kind of like uh, Kehoe, Pullman, <laughs> uh, Seymour Creek, it, it had been ditched for agricultural uses. The urban environment grew up around it. Um, not a lot of options in here. And this is a US post office wall. This is a University of California building. This is head cutting, like uh, I saw Seymour Creek head cutting today. Um, because when, when creeks are ditched, uh, they're too steep. If they're too steep, they need to erode through head cutting with these head falls, uh, head cuts. Uh, these little waterfalls just move up the channel. And it's because they're too straight and, and they're too steep. Now, the other thing you see here is the creek's trying to re-meander re re itself and make itself longer. And that's the other way these channels, they'll try to deal with the fact that they've been ditched. So what's the solution? The solution really is to try to make the channel longer. Uh, because if the channel's longer, the slope is less steep. Just think about skiing down a mountain. If you just skied straight down the mountain, um, well, if I did, I'd kill myself, you know, because I'd be going too fast. And so we take a meandering route in order to make the slope less. Well, that's exactly what streams do. Um, and so if we can get that meander and that length back in, um, it, will, it, it greatly stabilizes them. Um, and so here, eventually, the university realized they should move this building. And um, here's the ditch that is uh, uh, what that creek looks like with the grass uh, taken off it. Um, and now it is put in at the right width. It's put in at the right depth and it's put in at the right length. The post office wall was moved back using state grant monies, paid for the whole thing. Okay. Restriped the parking lot, so no parking spaces were lost. I know how emotional cities get about parking spaces. <laughs> um, and that's what that area looks like today. Another shot of that area uh, that citizens used uh, Coastal Conservancy money for this area. It was a, it's a nice public seating area by the creek. Um, another portion of that creek with uh, failing concrete right next to a plumbing business. This was a hairy project, taking out that concrete. And then using these soil bioengineering systems to stabilize the creek next to that building. Let me tell you a little bit about soil bioengineering. 
Um, it involves using willows, cottonwoods, dogwood, nine bark, native plants. And you can bundle them in, in uh, certain ways so that when they're planted in the banks, they have very, very dense root structure. Um, soil bioengineering is the merging of mechanical engineering and plant ecology. Um, somebody who championed this was a civil engineer who was chair of the University of Michigan Engineering Department. And he paired up with a landscape architect and they wrote a book, Soil Biotechnical Slope Control, where they quantify the ability of these uh, bundled plant systems to handle shear stresses from the water in pounds per square foot. Um, and we uh, now have available to us from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Natural Resources Conservation Service tables that compare these soil bioengineering systems, willow posts, willow stakes, racines, brush layering, brush matting, with boulders, one-ton boulders, half-ton boulders, quarter-ton boulders, gabions. And that shows that they have the same uh, ability to handle shear stresses in pounds per square foot as these uh, old engineering tools of rock and boulders and riprap and gabions. Um, this project uses no rock, it uses no gabions, it uses no riprap, it uses no concrete retaining walls. The stability is because the width of the creek is right, the depth of the creek is right, and there's soil bioengineering, and the length has been increased so that it is not too steep. And look at this thin, narrow right away we have to work within. You have so many opportunities here with places like Kehoe or Seymour or or Pullman Creek because you have space that none of these cities have. So there's no reason why we can't do this kind of thing here. There's absolutely no reason. There's no monetary reason. There's no physical reason. There's no energy, engineering reason. Uh, that, there's that site right after, a year after it was put in. And that's that site after the vegetation was pruned and thinned and reused for another restoration site. Uh, there's a ditch for you. Um, that looks like Kehoe to me. <laughs> um, right? it's, uh, it, it's in the city of El Cerrito. It's in a big vacant lot that used to be a railroad right away. Um, and it was, it was actually slated for development. Um, there's another uh, view of that site. It's in a commercial district, commercial industrial area. It's just a ditch, right? Um, matter of fact, it had no name. The public came along and named it Baxter Creek. Uh, went to the Coastal Conservancy, got some planning grants. They came up with a design to restore this creek. Um, 2005, the restoration project went in. Note that ditch is now a creek. It's longer. It's got a meander. Um, this is now called the gateway to the city of El Cerrito. That's how important that ditch became. It became the identity of the city of El Cerrito, where the community gathers. Um, Okay, and that's the creek. A really lovely place to go visit. Uh, and we're going upstream here on Baxter Creek. We're on a median strip between two streets. There's a culvert running under here that's too small, stormwater culvert. Because it's too small, it floods the streets when it rains. The water goes into people's garages. <laughs> uh, goes up on their lawns, into their driveways, right? Um, the city engineer knew he, he needed to do something with this undersized culvert. Um, they penciled out the cost of two alternatives. One alternative was 
to go in and remove the culverts and replace them with new big ones, or just take out the old culverts and put in a new ch uh, an above ground channel. The creek was cheaper, so they went with that. It was totally a financial decision. Uh, all right, so uh, the, the culvert was dug up. Here they are taking them out. Um, a V-shaped channel was put in by an engineering firm uh, with riprap that didn't have experience with uh, restoring stream channels. So this is a lesson that you, you have to have engineering firms or firms who have a history of restoration to do this work. Um, Otherwise, you can get some pretty bad results. And this was a very bad result quickly with the stream eroding around all the rock. Uh, my nonprofit was called in to rescue this project, and uh, this is back in 1996. Um, we saved some of the rock. We created steps and pools. Uh, this is right after construction. This is on a 10% slope. Um, I don't know if you have any 10% slopes in Half Moon Bay. You might in the very headwaters of some of these watersheds. Um, you can do restoration on very steep slopes. You can do restoration on very flat slopes. Uh, and then this is uh, what that creek looks like today. It looks like a mountain stream in the Sierra, uh, and people visit it with their kids. Um, it's a very popular project. Everybody wants to move to this neighborhood now. And that's a photograph taken from a kite, a camera run up a kite uh, to get a bird's eye view of that creek that's in the middle of a median strip between two streets. Um, how did the city of El Cerrito pay for this? State of California grants. You can get 100% funding from State of California grants. Um, one thing I wanted to call your attention to, and I will leave this with your Planning Commission chair, is there is a bill in the state legislature right now that would uh, specifically have the reason to give grants to cities like yours to do planning and design, to do the advance work. Um, you know, to have the community meetings, to call in all the stakeholders, uh, to bring, you know, get engineering drawings, landscape architecture drawings. And so I hope your commission uh, will vote to support this and recommend to the city council to send a letter of support uh, for this, this program. Because uh, that can be uh, one of the... Um, uh, most important barriers to, re to remove is just to get in the community involvement and planning part and to have the money for that. Um, and that's what that, that project looks like from this, the street level today. Um, and I'm taking you to a low-income poverty neighborhood in Richmond, has a high crime rate, uh, failing concrete, failing riprap along a stream, uh, and the community comes together, they get a grant from the Coastal Conservancy and uh, uh, put in uh, new meanders, put in the right width and depth for the creek channel, the length, and soil bioengineering. Uh, another unlikely project, uh, we're in a school grounds in uh, Albany, basically, of uh, Berkeley. Uh, keep your eye on that old swing set. That was on top of a culvert. This is Blackberry Creek. Um, and it is being dug up. It is 20 feet down below the surface of the playground. 25 feet. And uh, people are going, are you crazy? You're doing this in a playground at an elementary school? And you're digging a ditch 25 feet down? You're going to kill the kids, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, this is this project going in, soil bioengineering, willow stakes being pounded in. And that's what it looked like when it was done. And uh, that, that was about uh, six months later. Uh, this is a much loved uh, park, 
for the neighborhood, for the school. Uh, the kids are involved in science projects. Uh, they've made uh, murals on the school grounds of the creek and the creatures. Uh, they discovered that there was a broken sewer line in town and they all wrote letters to the mayor and the broken sewer line got <laughs> fixed. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, these, these projects have multiple benefits to the community. Soil bioengineering, this is a branch cut off from a willow. It's about uh, five feet long. It's about three inches wide. It's been pointed on the end. Here are some people pounding it in, into the ground. Um, you can actually do this on a very large scale with um, you know, excavators for miles, thousands of feet, very quickly and inexpensively. Um, this is the result. Uh, this is great. This is actually from the Midwest where they had ice flows. <laughs> um, and uh, th th that's the kind, you know, you get this very solid <laughs> plant growth along the river that prevents erosion and also helps prevent this entrenchment that you're seeing in your stream channels um, where the bottoms just start sinking and sinking. Um, here we are in a situation where there's a building really too close to a creek and there's brush layering being used here, a soil bioengineering technique, and erosion control fabric, uh, which uh, has been greatly improved uh, in modern day, made out of uh, coconut uh, fibers and tested in hydraulic flumes that can take six to seven pounds per square foot shear stresses. You cannot stabilize a stream just using fabric. But if you combine the fabric of the plants, uh, the two really work together well. That's another example of soil bioengineering, uh, brush layering being used on a large flood control channel in Northern California. And here's that same site that I was showing back here uh, three years later. Uh, I'm now back to the city of El Cerrito. By now, the city of El Cerrito has probably, uh, one, once those projects happened on Baxter Creek that I just mentioned, uh, they realized how popular they were with the public. Um, they realized how it was solving flooding problems. They realized how it was solving erosion problems. When a developer came into this area by the BART tracks, the city of El Cerrito required the developer, as a condition of its development, to daylight the creek next to it. Santa Rosa Creek, a trapezoidal flood control channel, uh, uh, turned into this engineering project in the 60s for a, for a one in 100 year flood protection. The city engineer in the city decided to jackhammer up that concrete, allow a floodplain to develop, put in a sort of architectural treatment at the top, which is a trail, but it also contains the one in 100 year flood. No additional right of way was needed. They did not need to buy more land. Very important point to make here. Here this project is performing under the flood of record in 2005. So th there's a lot of engineering conventions that are turned upside down by these restoration projects. The conventional wisdom is, A, if you ha add plants to stream channels, it's gonna create flooding. B, if you make these channels more natural, you're gonna have to have more space. That's not necessarily true, although it can be good to have more space. 
see that it's more expensive to do it this way. And it is, uh, with the state grants programs, it's not. You actually get help from the outside for handling local public works issues. Um, and finally, uh, that uh, somehow you're really not addressing public hazards if you, if you restore the waterways. There's a high school mural. Uh, this is now, you know, this is a, an adverbious fishery stream. Um, and, and so the, the city and the students all got behind doing a good thing for the environment. Um, Ashland, Oregon similarly looked at a, um, that this was a sort of a rectangle, <laughs> a rectangular flood control project where they've enhanced it uh, because they, they want tourists to come to Ashland. Uh, Boulder Creek uh, res was restored into an Olympic uh, kayaking run <laughs> uh, in their downtown. And San Antonio River is, is a famous example of, um, of uh, you know, a very urban stream restoration project. Um, so that was about, uh, what, uh, 40 minutes? Um, I think I, I got it out of the wire. Uh, why don't, uh, you know, I did have a thought, by the way, when I went out to um, uh, Seymour Creek today. Yeah, it's been ditched. It's sort of L-shaped. Um, what, uh, what some ranchers are doing up in Plumas County, uh, they, they innovated this, oh gosh, in the 90s. Um, they had ditches like that. You know, they ditched the streams to go around their ranches where they wanted to farm or put their cows to get them out of the way. And uh, uh, then they realized that that was counterproductive because uh, it really hurt the value of the uh, pastures where their cows were. Because, you know, the, the water used to be up here. The creeks were up here. The pastures were well irrigated. And then uh, when they ditched them, the, the creeks just you know, went to China, <laughs> they entrenched. And it really hurt the quality of the grasses and the pastures. So what they, they've done is uh, go into these ditches like you have and dam up the, the headwater of the channel to create a pond. And then they release the water from that pond to a new channel that's been dug on the top of the terrace. So instead of the creek being 25, 30 feet long, it's now up here. Uh, and it can meander through the fields. And it, it's not the same erosion hazard that you have now. Um, so plug, plug and pond is what that's called. Uh, that's, that's what came to my mind when I looked at that. And uh, yeah, I could see exploring that kind of alternative for something like that. Um, <coughs> let me open it up for questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, so with that, um, any questions from the commission of Dr. Ren? So thanks for the presentation. Um, I was thinking about, so I'm gonna ask a question about Seymour, if anybody wants to, if anybody's uncomfortable with Seymour, being up here, okay. So um, I, I'm, I know that, that part of the challenge with Seymour is that the water quality is less than pristine. And I wonder if you have uh, any experience or guidance to help us think about how to address the toxins in the water as a, you know, in conjunction with this kind of work yeah. that you I, talked about. You know, I do have a thought about that. Um, uh, <coughs> I have a paper I wrote for the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, and the title of it is Putting a Price on um, Repairing Areas for Water Quality Benefits, essentially. And what the science has discovered is that, uh, let's say about 5,000 feet, let's say, or even less, you know, take it down to 1,000 feet, of uh, repairing vegetation and floodplain have the same functions as a brick and mortar water, water quality treatment plant. Uh, so one of the slideshows that I show 
shows a brick and mortar plant built by the city of Santa Monica to treat you know, really polluted runoff. And they spent 20 million building the plant and it costs $100,000 a year to maintain it. Um, and it basically does what a riparian quarter does. It, um, it aerates the water, oxygenates it, has the nutrients fall out. Uh, it, the floodplain actually even treats the uh, bacteria coliform. Um, and so these natural systems are now understood to have you know, ecosystem services is the buzzword, and you can put a price on those. Um, and uh, it surprised a lot of the people at the San Francisco Regional Water Board that uh, these floodplains and riparian vegetation could actually take up bacteria coliform rather than just have water move it through, you know, spread it around. That was the conventional wisdom. But uh, the research is showing that these riparian areas actually treat the water. So the San Francisco Regional Water Board, where I worked for 15 years, began viewing these riparian quarters as their water treatment plants. And it's why they got testy and hot under the collar if you were going out to remove that vegetation because basically you're tearing down their treatment plant. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would look at that. Additional questions, Sarah? Do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Thank you for your presentation. I had a chance to peruse your book. Interesting okay. reading. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm going <coughs> to leave this with. Uh... Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for being here. I've had a, the pleasure of knowing some of the creeks that you've spoken about and, and having worked on some of those areas. So um, definitely good examples of natural infrastructure. Uh, Jill? We wanted to um, especially thank Dr. Riley before she um, goes out the door and note that we have our own uh, staff copy of her, of her book and we were attempting to get her to sign it. Um, also wanted to um, yeah, there you are. Um, I, so staff didn't have a, a chance to um, take a look at the presentation in advance, and we are certainly inspired by it. Um, we have questions, too, and I may shoot them to you in e an email, but just to share with the group a few things that I noticed and, of course, obviously haven't talked to uh, other staff about yet. Um, I think it would be really helpful, helpful for us to get a summary of sort of the, the overarching permitting that's required around this, as well as the sequel review, just to have a, a sense of what, what that's all about. And it gives us a, a timeline and, and some more context for kind of the bread and butter of what we do in planning. Um, I was, um, I, I noted that the term ditch is used with affection by Dr. Riley. I know we're, we're, um, <laughs> we're reverting to water, well, we're moving on to water course here because we, we think it's a, a better descriptor for our town, um, but I, I did just, it perked my ears up. Um, I also noticed uh, some of these projects where uh, there were trails right on top of bank, and I suppose that's really only probably allowed because they had been ditched and they're becoming habitat, but we, we aren't intending to do that here with any of our existing water courses, and I just want to be clear with, with folks because you've seen a lot of um, buffers and setback requirements in our natural resources chapter. And then just because um, I have to make sure nobody's confused about these kinds of things. Dr. Uh, Riley was a guest, and we are so um, appreciative. She's generously shared her wisdom and highlights of her extensive and uh, successful experiences. Um, I just, she's not a consulting to the city. I just don't want to confuse people about that. I think, I think that's really important, and there was, um, 
I don't, I don't think she meant to reference any particular project, but there was something in her presentation that may have um, led somebody to, to think that there was a project because there was a reference to the commission voting on something. There is no project. There's nothing on the agenda like that. And that's all. I just um, got to do my, my little cleanup. So um, we love that, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Sure, we got a request for a five minute break. Let's go ahead and pause. Five minutes. That one. I did that to you, sorry. Everything's been coming in just thirty to forty percent.
I, I, okay. All right, we're going to get back to the uh, Planning Commission meeting. If we could take our seats and uh, get ready to go. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder, all right, we'll bring it back in. Planning Commission meeting is back in session. Just a reminder, if uh, folks are interested in speaking on uh, this item, to please fill out a green card and submit that. So now we will transition over into our uh, staff presentation portion of the uh, local coastal plan update. Thank you. We are. And, and just a point of order um, to the chair, if I may. Uh, I have a, a red eye flight I'm catching this evening, so if I step out, um, I'd send my uh, condolences for missing the rest of the meeting, but, uh, but that's where I'll be going if I have to step out. And you will be able to watch the rest of it after the fact. Um, these are all posted, so I hope that works out for you. All right. Uh, so next slide. Uh, at our last meeting, we discussed the proposed changes to plan development areas with the updated draft development chapter, uh, how we can take a watershed level planning approach to avoid on and off site impacts from future development. Uh, one of the, the concerns was to ensure that the draft land use plan policies are adequate to achieve this approach, especially as they relate to hazards and natural resources. These policies are included at a high level in the development chapter because they are contained elsewhere in the draft land use plan. And any proposal for new development or a new master plan is subject to compliance with all ap applicable land use plan policies. We wanted to... Um, dig into that a little bit more tonight because that was such a topic for you uh, a month ago. And Brittany will do that in a little bit. I'm going to um, start on a, on a different angle. But your staff report also showed how uh, policies would combine from all the different chapters. We were trying to uh, work, work through a, a kind of a case study. Um, so we've also received feedback about uh, the plan development policies, how specific they are. Um, so we expect, uh, we've been expecting the Planning Commission would like to explore this a little bit more. Uh, so we're, we're going to set that up tonight for, for the first time here. So I'm going to retread a, a bit going through how the PDs were planned at a policy level, specifically to highlight primary differences and similarities between what is on the books now, your 1996 land use plan, and what is proposed in this uh, draft update. And we're going to use Venice Beach PD um, to continue it as, as our example because it, it's a pretty good one for, uh, has components that most of the other PDs have. All right. So um, as much as we would like to present uh, this draft land use plan as a completely fresh take on your 1996 document, the truth is of the matter is that many fundamental assumptions and requirements for plan developments were brought forward, often clarified and updated to address changed circumstances. So, for example, if the Venice Beach plan development or any other PD for that matter was proposed for development, a master plan, in this case a specific plan, would be required consistent with the land use plan policies for review and approval by city and review and certification by Coastal Commission. Here's the process flow of uh, your 1996 land use plan on, on the left. And I know we say 1993. We've, we've got all these um, floating dates that the document was finished in 93. I think it was officially certified in 96 and um, ready for use. And so we, Brittany and I have decided that we're going to pick a year at some point and it's going to be real clean <laughs> and we'll quit bouncing around. Um, so anyway, you, you see that approach on the left and on the right is uh, what's included in this uh, draft document. And you'll note uh, two early steps are highlighted. Uh, the master plan site assessment is really the biggest uh, 
introduction as a preliminary step. If this uh, step identifies site opportunities and constraints, um, figures out what uh, net developable acreage would be, it leads to a deliberative ma uh, manner to uh, determining appropriate uses, build out, and site planning in advance of preparing the master plan. This process is implied in your existing plan. Um, but it's made really deliberate here because it's so important and we think it helps. We think it helps clarify the intent and um, so that was policy 279 and we love feedback about policy 279 because it's something that um, I'll be clear. I think the LCP update subcommittee liked it but staff really thinks it would help us in, in working on these projects. It's hard to make a good plan without those steps. So we also, uh, this is a repeated slide, I, I won't linger on it, but these were the, the topics to be included in this comprehensive site assessment. Um, the bottom two are really um, what we added, uh, the stormwater management and neighborhood compatibility. And to be fair to everybody in the room, we haven't heard from property owners or anyone else that these two criteria are objectionable in any way. We would assume that these are really fundamental um, planning components that should be in your plan. Okay. So uh, back to our example, uh, site plan design goals that were brought forward from the existing land use plan to protect coastal resources, avoid hazardous areas, provide public access and recreation, and protect scenic qualities. For our Venice plan development example, land uses and allowed density policies of the existing land use plan and the, um, the new draft that you're reviewing, they're, they're quite similar. Uh, specific acreages for agriculture and outdoor commercial recreation are provided for clarity. The old plan, um, that the plan you have now says you need to keep the same amount um, that's there at the time that the plan was adopted. We measured how much was there and just acknowledged that. We thought that was helpful. Um, and also, uh, it, we are noting a, a, a slightly lowered build out because of the estimated ne net acreage, but remember that's an estimate. The existing land use plan does not show density bonus units but they are permitted by your zoning ordinance. So we are showing them here for comparison. So that left column, that green highlight, um, that's a potential density bonus that could happen in, in the Venice plan development um, on the books right now. So um, the draft update provides two options for combinations of residential and outdoor recreation. We did this intentionally to get a sense of what the commission and the community might see as trade-offs um, between scale and amount of uses. Um, options like this don't need to be included in the land use plan. Um, it could be reverted to just the maximums, the way that the 96 uh, land use plan uh, presents them. And I want to make a note about that because you've, you've got um, a, a letter in the record about uh, this, how specific it is to put a cap on development um, for different parts of town and the plan developments in particular. So, I'm, you know, we're, we're <laughs> under the gun here to give you a, a plan that has, uh, complies with general plan law and where we know what the build out's going to be we need to have a development envelope for all of the designations in the city, whether they're straight up zoning, which has density and intensity caps, or they're in the plan developments. And in fact, you have caps in your 1996 document right now. This is not an introduction. Okay. So next. Um, some siting and design policies. Uh, quite a few are similar. Um, in some cases, they're more specific to um, hopefully 
help achieve the intended purpose, perhaps we got to be too specific. So we would love to hear the Planning Commission if, if you'd like to reel it back. Um, this is your, your chance to think about that. Um, but do note the 20% open space requirement, that is brought forward as is, although you can put your green infrastructure in that area. So it gives it another use. Uh, visual resource protection goals to maintain ocean views from Highway 1 and protect Venice Boulevard as a view corridor. Um, they're maintained, they're supplemented with suggested 100 foot visual buffers and height limits for structures. Um, we, we showed a 15 foot height limit with caveats for other ways of addressing that. That's a policy in your visual resources chapter of your existing land use plan. That's, that's not brand new. That's already applicable to the PD that we're using as an example. Uh, vehicular access from Highway 1 uh, limited to one additional opening rather than two with a frontage road between the new access and Venice if intersection improvements are necessary. What I say about this one is we know a lot more about roadway volume and capacity and uh, it's not going to be easy to deal with it, to mitigate it. The fewer driveways, the better your existing land use plan um, or, or street connections. The existing plan um, that you have in the books now actually has a policy about uh, limiting the number of additional um, uh, roads and connections to Highway 1 for that, for that reason. But this is a place where we looked for some consolidation. We did that in other PDs as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities are suggested to align with, uh, I, had a, I apologize, there was a typo there, not a typo, but I, I, I missed my road. It's, it should be Frenchman's Creek Road. Uh, I think I put in Rousseau Francais, um, got the wrong, wrong French road, so um, it should have been Frenchman's Creek Road. This is new because it's reflecting a new condition. There's the ability to make a linkage between the Coastal Trail and the Na Naomi Patridge Trail. That opportunity didn't exist when your 1996 plan was, was adopted. You didn't have both of those facilities available. Um, from there, uh, we also made a few other basic assumptions in this PD that um, perhaps uh, you want to think about whether they're, they're too much or not enough. And I'm sure we'll get community comment about this um, because it has implications. If, if, you, if you don't like how Venice was done, then we're going to look at how, how the other ones might need to be adjusted. But um, we assume there would need to be a buffer of some sort between residential development and outdoor commercial recreation or agricultural uses. Um, can you click back? Oh, never mind. The map is coming the other way. We'll get there. Um, we just thought the bike ped path was a convenient um, way to do the buffer. It doesn't have to be the way to do the buffer. It was just presented in that manner. So again, um, remembering the difference between what's suggested and what's actually required. Um, really, the only new policies in here are uh, I mean, really new are about phasing. We're trying to clean up the phasing um, uh, expectations for these different plan developments. A number of the existing PDs have quite uh, challenging phasing uh, requirements to comply with, and they are not realistic. They don't relate to how developers actually develop. And so we've simplified them and aligned them to the kinds of um, land uses and projects the way that we would expect them to come through. Um, let's see. And then, of course, the neighborhood compatibility, which was new. And then uh, this was really important to the uh, LCP update subcommittee that we have sensitivity about the Sweetwood Group Camp, um, which is nearby there. And let's see. So there's our, that was our little diagram with 
our illustrative planning purposes only lingo, remembering that this is the best information that we have at this time. Um, we believe that you would end up with a substantially similar starting point as shown in this diagram as the, the 1996 document. The main differences are increased uh, specif specificity, I can't talk anymore tonight, which mostly consists of suggestions like the 100 foot visual setback that's not written as a uh, requirement, it's written as a suggestion um, to, to support the view corridor, uh, the pre-application site assessment, uh, and um, coming forth with a, what we hope is a more realistic and appropriate build out, some control around how circulation works and enhanced protection of visual resources. Now, we're going to switch over and um, Brittany is going to continue this scenario and she's going to do a run through with the rest of the land use plan chapters and how policies in those chapters would be applicable beyond the plan development and PD specific policies in the development chapter. Okay. So as Jill mentioned, uh, all development and master plan proposals are subject to compliance with all of the applicable land use plan policies. We've been studying these chapters more one by one in these study sessions and uh, with the recent focus on the development chapter, that's been a little hard to convey. So we want to show how all these policies weave together and highlight some of the main differences between the existing plan and the proposed draft update. So Jill just went through how the development chapter applies to our Venice Beach scenario, and we haven't quite finished the public works chapter, so I'll start with ag. So ag and outdoor commercial recreation are permitted uses in the Venice PD, which is consistent with the existing equestrian facilities as an ag compatible use. The main differences between the existing plan and the updated draft are the prime and non-prime soils map which shows Venice containing soils that meet the definition of prime ag land, and the additional allowances for supplemental uses and farm worker housing to ensure the continued viability of ag and ag compatible operations. The draft ag chapter also introduces applicable policies on land use compatibility and visual resources that encourage clustering of structures and buffers between ag and non-ag land uses. There's also water supply and management practice policies related to climate change and sea level rise planning that are introduced. And these new policy additions all supplement and enhance the existing land use plans policy goals of supporting ag and horticulture in our city and would be applicable in the review of a master plan for Venice Beach. The coastal access and recreation policies are substantially similar with a focus on protecting Venice Boulevard as a primary coastal access route and Venice Beach as a coastal access point with public beach parking. Siting and design of the Venice Beach master plan would have to consider these access de designations as well as provide enhanced bike pad access and outdoor recreation opportunities. The main differences introduced in the draft update applicable to Venice Beach master planning are policies related to providing sufficient emergency access and evacuation routes, an emphasis on lower cost visitor serving recreation opportunities, and planning for impacts and eventual loss of public access and recreation areas from sea level rise. The biggest change in the natural resources chapter is our updated habitat mapping. We've identified Venice Beach PD as containing potential ASHA, environmentally sensitive habitat area, for its potential San, Francis San Francisco garter snake and California red-legged frog upland and dispersal habitat. Venice is also adjacent to ASHA areas. Frenchman's Creek is a protected riparian corridor, and the Western State Parks land is known red-legged frog upland and dispersal habitat. The process for natural resource protection is generally the same in the existing and the proposed draft update. Study the site, identify the resources, and protect them with the applicable buffers and allowed uses. The current plan identifies Frenchman's Creek as a perennial riparian corridor with a 50-foot buffer requirement, while the updated draft proposes a 100-foot buffer, in this case with an undeveloped PD next to a perennial riparian corridor. The surrounding ASHA requires a 100-foot buffer and is limited to resource-dependent uses such as trails and habitat restoration. 
the existing uses within the buffer zones would be considered legal non-conforming and would have to comply with the updated buffer requirements if they were to redevelop under the master plan. Hydrology and water quality policies are also significantly enhanced with an emphasis on using green infrastructure and preserving natural hydrology uh, to avoid downstream impacts from new development. And applicable policies also require planning for sea level rise impacts, SESHA, and water quality in site plan design. The coastal hazards chapter is significantly updated with improved mapping and best available science on sea level rise and climate change and policies addressing fire hazards that are all applicable to a Venice Beach master plan. The updated chapter builds on the existing goal to not cause or contribute to flood, flood hazards and identifies the southwestern corner of Venice as being in the tsunami and dam failure inundation zones, as you can see on this graphic. And Frenchman's Creek is also in a 100-year flood zone. So development would need to avoid these areas under your existing plan as well as the draft update. The Venice PD is over 300 feet away from the shoreline, so bluff top erosion hazard policies are not applicable in this scenario. Fire hazard policies are new to the land use plan update and would require siting and design of the PD to avoid wildfire risk areas and establish fuel modification zones that avoid impacts to ESHA to the extent feasible. New sea level rise policies require hazards to be assessed as part of a geologic report which could influence the siting and design of the PD as well as any redevelopment of structures near the creek. The cultural resources chapter has primarily been updated to include tribal consultation and historic resource protection policies with an updated historic resources map. For our cultural and archeological resource protection, policies are substantially similar for requiring professional surveying, reporting, and avoidance or mitigation measures for development near any known or newly identified resources. Most applicable to the Venice PD are the historic resource protection policies you can see the orange dot just north of Venice Boulevard there. That's 1820 Cabrillo Highway North, and that is currently listed on the city's historic resources inventory as significant for its vernacular architecture. Staff does need to clarify exactly which structure that is referring to, but uh, the concept is there that the historic resource protection policies would apply for any development or redevelopment of the site. The black not evaluated dot um, along Frenchman's Creek and Highway 1 there refers to the highway bridge over Frenchman's Creek, which is outside of the PD area, but would also need evaluating if any road or intersection improvements for the Venice PD were to impact the site. And finally, for the scenic and visual resources chapter, the existing and proposed updated draft policies are comparably focused on protecting Venice Boulevard as a view corridor and protecting ocean views across the site from Highway 1. Your existing land use plan identifies the PD as a viewshed and Venice Boulevard as a primary scenic coastal access route, which is brought forward with the draft update. The existing land use plan also, require, also includes requirements for clustered structures and 15-foot building height limitations, as Jill mentioned, and those policies were brought forward in the scenic and visual resources chapter as well as the development chapter. The primary difference with the draft update of this chapter are the updated uh, visual resources map and the clarifying policies on the process for identifying visual resources and evaluating proposed impacts specifically for PD master planning. There are also a number of lighting standards intended to protect dark night skies. Providing setbacks for upland slope view protection from public access areas such as the coastal trail is also a clarified requirement in the draft update, which goes hand in hand in this case with the required 100 foot ESHA setback from the Western State Parks land for uh, the Venice Beach PD. So back to what you would end up with for the Venice Beach site plan, the 2018 draft carries forward the, the foundational policies and goals of the existing plan for coastal resource protection and hazard avoidance, but includes more specific and up-to-date language to address current planning concerns and best available science. So start to finish, the plan as a whole carries out Coastal Act requirements and community priorities in a more holistic and 
deliberate and forward thinking way. And to summarize, the policies of the land use plan would be applied as a whole to assessment of any development or master plan proposal. The primary new concepts introduced to the land use plan can help achieve our needs for watershed level thinking as we discussed at our last meeting. And there's certainly room for improvement, but we should just take care not to be redundant in the development chapter where these concepts are addressed in other chapters. And I'll hand it back to Jill. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, these next two PDs, but because you ha you've received input from the majority property owner of the Surf Beach Dunes Beach PD and a few owners of properties in the North Wavecrest area, we just note that the Venice PD example hopefully helps you um, think through some of the context with respect to their input. And uh, for Surf Dunes, we note that um, the type and location of development was generally brought forward from the 1996 land use plan and uh, noting uh, which it specified primarily residential use with some visitor serving commercial uses um, cited south of Young Avenue if the city determined they were needed. And we agreed with that arrangement and that's, that's what you're seeing there. And then uh, North Wavecrest is a bit more complex. The planning area changed quite a bit as a result of land trust pur purchases. Uh, North Wavecrest, as we've, we've discussed before, is proposed to have two separate and distinct areas. The approach considers each of these areas in relationship with land use adjacencies, compatibility, opportunities, and constraints. You've heard from landowners that there is interest in broadening the range of uses of course, we are happy to hear from the commission about um, our first suggestion here in this draft document as depicted on this diagram. And um, that's as deep as I want to dig on those two, but I, we just know that you've, you've had uh, letters, you have a new letter from last week um, from uh, EMC planning regarding uh, chapters four through nine of the draft local coastal land use plan. I just want to note for the record that you received uh, this um, and that was the intent of it being uh, sent through staff to you. And uh, you've had a number of comments at the podium on, on this as well. So you'd asked how we were going to respond. We, we wanted to give you context tonight. And now we're going to ping pong again. Brittany is going to give an update on countywide planning efforts relative to our land use plan update. Okay, so I'll go through this. Quickly, the uh, San Mateo County has created a coalition for climate change preparation and planning that myself and Jill and our city manager and public works director have all been participating in, um, along with other local jurisdiction staff, nonprofits, academics, elected officials, and emergency responders. So this is all highly relevant to our planning efforts here, especially with the watershed level thinking approach for hazard avoidance and natural resource protection that we've been discussing, uh, as well as the stream restoration efforts that we just heard from Dr. Riley. So our most recent meeting was about preparing for wildfire and of course very relevant to our land use plan update as well as our safety element. And I just wanted to share some interesting things that I learned. Um, so we heard from the chief of CAL FIRE, the mayor of Sonoma County, and a number of other emergency responders about how climate change is impacting wildfire behavior. As you can see on this graph, we're seeing a change in the acreage of fire footprints shown in the blue line, rather than an increase in the number of fires shown in the red line. So that's really showing that fires are burning bigger and faster rather than increasing in number themselves. Uh, this can be attributed to a number of factors. Overnight temperatures have been at their highest in recent years, and that really affects the ability for firefighters to control fires overnight, and also extends the time period that the fires can spread into daytime. Uh, we're seeing a longer fire season, almost year-round, and, and those extended periods of drier, warmer conditions lead to higher fuel loads and faster burning fires. And the CAL FIRE chief said that the last two years have been the worst that he's seen in his entire career, and that really scared me. Um, 
the very opening comments of the whole meeting were about eucalyptus, as we talked about last time, and their high fuel load, but potential for high habitat value. Um, Koi Park in El Granada, you might know, was um, very recently designated as one of 35 priority areas for uh, statewide fuel reduction projects by CAL FIRE. Not in our jurisdiction, but we see really similar high fuel load conditions, such as in Carter Hill. There's a lot of discussion around fuel modification and defensible space and the terminology of fuel modification and vegetation management. Fuel modification is the preferred term. It's more strategic uh, and it doesn't put the burden on vegetation removal. Buildings can also be fuel and not just vegetation. So we are contributing to fuel loads by building what is burning. So part of a fuel modification strategy is to first build in the right place to create that defensible space and then manage vegeta vegetation as needed. We also learned about uh, some efforts going on in other jurisdictions in San Mateo County. Just a couple that stuck out to me were looking into designated temporary refuge areas, so shelter in place, um, identified areas where first responders would go first because they are near high fuel loads, they have high population densities and restricted emergency um, evacuation routes. The high school came to mind for me. There's one way in, one way out. A lot of people there during school hours and high fuel load nearby. And San Carlos is installing thermal sensing cameras in their canyons for early fire detection. Interesting, low maintenance, one time cost way to, um, to detect detect fires where you normally wouldn't have that access. Um, and then digital emergency evacuation route signs were also brought up, uh, another way to, in real time, provide those updates to people driving on the roads, trying to evacuate, um, letting them know which ways are safe and where to go. So here are a couple resources. Um, San Mateo County Alert System, if you haven't signed up already, please do so, it's really, important that, um, that you're involved in this. They can't reach you and let you know of an emergency if you're not registered, and it's really easy to register. Uh, you can choose what kind of alerts you want so you don't have to get the full spectrum, but um, all kinds of traffic and other hazard emergencies. And they are coming out with Spanish translation um, for these alerts in the next couple months, and they're looking um, in the near future to add on more language translation translations. Uh, the Fire Safe San Mateo website is uh, really useful. I would highly recommend um, looking up this brochure. You can download the PDF, uh, Living with Fire. Um, there's a really great checklist for homeowners in the back. You can just look at easy ways to protect your home from wildfire. Great resource for homeowners. And the Climate Ready San Mateo County website. Um, you can get more information there and even learn how to get involved yourself. And that's all. Thank you. Brittany has done a fabulous, just an incredible job digging into that. And uh, we really have noted that um, throughout our organization over at City Hall. And um, we know she cares a lot about it. So we appreciate that. We have a final uh, topic for tonight. Um, this is quick, and we'll get it back over to the commission. Last meeting, um, maybe even more than that, uh, public and planning commissioners asked about the relationship and or conflict between lot retirement and transfer of development rights. Um, how do they work together or do they not work together? So I'm going to take a, just a quick shot to um, hopefully simplify this and, and give you some ways of thinking about it. Um, the, the upshot is lot retirement is proposed as a requirement. Transfer of development rights would be an incentive. So the requirement is like a condition of approval or some other city regulation or ordinance that would be um, standard, uh, standard application. For example, a subdivision would need to contribute to the parkland fee. 
it would just be another thing on that list. Um, let me talk about a, a little bit about what's in your draft in terms of what's proposed and some uh, thoughts for you to um, consider and um, what is in the draft. Uh, as enacted by the Coastal Commission, lot retirement has been imposed to address the cumulative impacts on coastal access for creating new lots. Uh, the Commission's approach is one-to-one uh, -one. for every new residential lot created, uh, one is to be retired. For implementation uh, for the city, we will need to study this further to confirm um, the appropriate ratio or, or mechanism to do that or, or other measures that would uh, take into account as well the other ways that the city addresses cumulative impacts of development. For example, the city has a uh, traffic uh, impact fee. So that's, a, that's an impact fee that is intended to also address cumulative development. And you heard a comment about how um, lot retirement and traffic impact fee, you have to make sure you're not uh, charging twice for the same impact. So that would be uh, something that we would need to do um, within the scope of a lot retirement program and for implementation. We'd also encourage the commission to s consider um, some of the specific suggestions in your, in your draft for this lot retirement program. Um, right now, the way it's presented to you, uh, we, we took city council's direction very literally. They said, encourage development within the town center. And thus, uh, the draft shows that subdivisions within the town center would be exempt from lot retirement, as would affordable housing inside or outside of the town center. Now, uh, because we anticipate most development going forward would be in the town center, you may want to reconsider that because that's where you'd have the, the biggest opportunity for lot retirement if that's something that you're interested in, in encouraging. Um, so, so go back and um, take a look at those pieces. We also noted uh, we did not show uh, some detail about what a subdivision could be. So we all, I think, think about a, a new uh, parcel with a house on it. Could also be a condo. That's, that's a subdivision as well. So we're talking about ownership housing. Lot retirement, to my knowledge, with Coastal Commission has not applied to multifamily rental development. Um, it's something for you to consider. I, I am concerned about um, pushing that very hard because that's a development form that is more affordable by design for our community members, especially our renters, and um, putting, putting that burden on it could really uh, swing its affordability. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, now, back to transfer of development. Um, as proposed, um, it's voluntary. Uh, it's very simple. There would be areas that are donor areas and areas that are receivers. Uh, so developers who are seeking um, to uh, develop projects with more density within areas designated as receivers, such as the entire town center area, that could purchase and retire lots um, that are in the donor areas. Now, there's a lot of detail to be worked out, and um, this is this is the concept of it. And you'll s you noted, and I think we talked about it last time. There's there's three different types of lot retirement um, included in or transfer development rights. Excuse me, included in the plan um, from outside the town center to inside donor to receiver. Um, we were floating an idea about uh, North Wave Crest as a donor to. Uh, Dolores to give it another another place to um, be received, and then um, of course transfer of development rights can happen internally um, within a PD through arrangements by various owners. So uh, there's there's a policy that that leads to that. Um, so the the conclusion: lot retirements and TDR can be implemented independently of each other as well as concurrently, and um, they both need implementation um, studies to support them. This is something that would get developed 
um, as the plan is adopted and moves forward. And th there's going to be quite a few things that we're going to bring through your shop to uh, get the plan really up and running and humming once you're once you're moving it onto the Coastal Commission. So I hope that helped. And that's what we have tonight for content. I'll talk about next steps when you're all done, but we're happy to get clarifying questions. We know we've got public staying late tonight, so hopefully they can all get their time in as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of information, good presentation. Um, any clarifying questions from the Planning Commission? Don't see anything? All right. Let's go ahead and just uh, open up the public comment period. I've got one green card here. Again, if you wish to speak, I've got two green cards here. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Ron Sissom. Good evening, commissioners um, and staff. My name is Ron Sissom. I'm a principal planner at EMC Planning Group down in Monterey. Um, we've been retained by Stephen Weed and the uh, Surf Beach Partners to help uh, with the process of planning and entitlements for that planned development site. We've gotten involved fairly recently, and uh, Stephen is bestowing his uh, long institutional knowledge of that property and and other things city on us. Uh, and we've had a chance to meet with Jill and some other staff to sort of kick off our involvement uh, in this planning process. Um, just a little, little background, EMC Planning Group's been in business for 40 years, all of those in Monterey. Uh, we do planning and environmental consulting work primarily, lots of entitlement management project work as well. Um, regulatory permitting work, we have biologists, cultural resources people and other sorts of uh, technical specialists on our staff. Um, in terms of, of this process, we recently completed LCP updates for the City of Pacific Grove and the City of Monterey on the Monterey Peninsula. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, are about to start another one for another city on the peninsula, the City of Marina. So we're fairly well versed in what you're going through and I do want to acknowledge staff and, and all of you, this is a heavy lift especially if staff is taking it on themselves in the course of their uh, effort to, uh, to manage uh, city planning processes and entitlements uh, in addition. So it is a heavy lift and I certainly do appreciate what it takes. Um, real quickly, um, our main uh, roles in this process uh, will be to prepare some uh, a range of technical studies for this site that will help inform our planning process one of the other major uh, pieces for us is to prepare a specific plan consistent with the PD requirements for a master plan. And uh, we'll also be putting together an application, a comprehensive application package uh, for the project that brings all the technical information, the specific plan, and, and other uh, attributes of the project into one place uh, uh, that we can submit to city staff. So we are in the process of, uh, of starting to generate those kinds of inputs and we'll be working with staff, uh, Jill and, and uh, the city's contract planner, Art, and others to sort of pull some of those together as well as working on those extensively in-house. We do have a number of other technical sub-consultants that we're working with that are, that are on our team that are looking at some of the issues that uh, Jill and staff have brought up about issues that are specific to individual sites. Can we drill down a little closer to about what's really going on in these individual sites? versus maybe not having as specific information as we might want to have given the level of information that is available to the city in planning and, and looking at issues that across the city and the region. So example, one of those would be looking at sea level rise and wave run up issues for this site based on site specific conditions versus having to, to project that based on more general information. Um, so, um, one of the things, at least one of our first, you know, sort of tasks in this, and Jill mentioned this earlier, is we have put together a couple of letters uh, to the Planning Commission and to staff about our thoughts about some of the policies and content of the, uh, the draft chapters, and you have those in front of you. Um, obviously, tonight's not the night to try to go through those, but of course, we're happy to participate and support anybody and everybody in this process by... Thank you. And we do have, we do have those letters. Yeah. And I uh, appreciate and it, so. speaking about those. So anyway, I just want to thank you. Just want to introduce ourselves. Great. And let you know thank you very much. And thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Ferreira.
Good evening, uh, Chairman Holt, uh, Planning Commissioners. Uh, you've covered actually a lot of ground tonight, so it's uh, rather impossible for a single speaker to go at all of it, but I'll just try to get at some things. Uh, let's try specific plans, which is in your current LCP. And I've talked to two executive directors of the Coastal Commissions that have held that unless exempted in the specific, I mean in the language of a given PUD, that a specific plan is required and the consent of the landowners to that specific plan is required. Wavecrest is an exception to that. You were allowed to do a partial specific plan in North Wavecrest. The South Wavecrest was done with the consent of all owners, mainly by one owner buying out everybody. Uh, if you look at the completed PUDs, you'll see that it was simpler ownership, one or two owners. So that's easier for agreement. Uh, what I didn't see in the stuff that I looked at was, are we still expressly requiring the agreement of property owners to this master plan or specific plan? And it's very, very important and very, very big. And the reason why you would want to do that, why you would want the agreement, is that you have things that are required in the PUD. You want to make sure that the, all the landowners share equally in that within the PUD, the obligations, okay? And the rewards, okay? So that's why you ask for approval. And I just think we need to get clear on that and not lose what has been conventional wisdom. So uh, coming around to lot retirement, it's not the fault of the staff or the current council or any of you folks, but it's been 15 years since the city agreed to do a lot retirement ordinance. It's in a signed agreement between the city, the Coastal Commission, and the Pacific Ridge people uh, in 2004 that the city would go forward with a lot retirement ordinance. So we're a bit behind on that one. Uh, well, I, paralyzed by the clock, actually. I had more, but I guess <laughs> the last thing I'll say is that for the Sierra Club, I would like to request the correspondence that's being distributed to the commissioners tonight or for this meeting, okay, to the Sierra Club. Thank you. Thank you. I've got no other green cards. Um, I do uh, see one other. Uh, yeah, Carrie Burke. Carrie Burke, thank you. Um, really appreciate staff's overview of the planned um, development districts. I think that was really instructive about how all the different components of the local coastal plan have to be taken into account in the planning exercise for these areas. And you can visualize how lot retirement could be utilized in the bigger projects because by the time you do the set-asides for your 20% um, open space and your new stormwater requirement for 5% five, five and your ESHAs and your prime soils that you, know, that you might actually come up with that one-to-one -one ratio for your, your units. What concerns me though about the lot retirement is for your smaller projects and how we could ever chase affordable housing with having this one-to-one -one ratio and having some opportunities for some smaller units more in the um, inner city area would be very difficult if you, in order to you know, achieve a project that you'd have to buy another lot just to you know, create a lot. So I just think that we have competing policies that for smaller projects especially, we really have to take a very close look at where it's appropriate to do that because there could be some of our, our denser um, 
more dense areas uh, would be you know, not appropriate for that lot or retirement because it just m might just make it that we have some areas that just go undeveloped. So just something to consider. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I'm getting a nod from staff, so yes. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I just couldn't get to it, but the uh, Peter Douglas said that lot retirement is one legal lot for one legal lot. He never, ever intended it to be condos or apartments or any of that kind of thing. So I think we'll not have any difficulty with the Coastal Commission if we take that tack on lot retirement. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for keeping it quick. Uh, do I have any other speakers for the public speaking period? Not seeing anybody, we'll close that and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Anybody want to start us off? Commissioner Benjamin. First, I don't know if we're aiming for 10 o'clock, but someone should keep an eye on the clock if we need a motion to extend 1030. Thank you. Um, so there were uh, great reports. Thank you very much, staff. Um, I ha And I appreciate the comments of the public as well. Thank you very much. Um, with respect to um, the broader set of plan development uh, items. I was reviewing our minutes from a January meeting that we had, and there was a helpful discussion of a, uh, a suggestion by staff that would help us manage their process, their, their way of uh, processing um, uh, the analysis of uh, master plans, um, other amendments to the local coastal, uh, local coastal program, and uh, it was actually published in the staff report. And I, in the rush of that meeting, I don't think I recall making a comment on it, but I just want to get in the record that I thought it was a really good idea. Um, it gave you some flexibility for uh, managing that process that I think is sorely needed. Um, similarly, uh, I appreciate uh, the comment from uh, former Mayor Ferreira with respect to uh, obtaining clarity on um, the rights of property owners in a planned development district uh, who may or may not be part of a proposed development in that district. I think uh, it's important for us to respect the rights of that property owner. I don't pretend to be the legal mind um, that understands that, but I really want to get clarity um, so that I am, we are truly providing equal protection under the law here. Um, with respect to um, the Venice example, um, that was very helpful. It helped us sort of, you know, try it on for size. Um, I thought the watershed level planning thinking was really helpful in that location because uh, that area does, except for Frenchman's Creek, that area doesn't have its own drainage. So unless we plan for a new drainage, it either has to find a way down into Frenchman's Creek or go to someplace else. And uh, it is not obvious how that would work. Um, it's certainly not obvious to me. Um, I d you asked whether we thought it was too specific uh, in terms of our thinking, and I want to say uh, I do not think that it is too specific. Um, you know, maybe I'm biased because I was a member of the committee that drafted it. Um, but, you know, it is not at the level of detail that you would expect in a zoning document. Um, it doesn't have the individual studies that are deeply tailored, but I think it carries conceptual ideas well. And uh, that's, that's the reason that I, and I, I think I can speak for uh, Rick, uh, felt like this was something that we wanted to bring to you. Um, in the discussion of the biologic resources on that particular parcel, not to call out an example that necessarily generalizes, but in addition to the frog and snake habitat sus suspicions and the, the reference in the document that you put up that sort of had a, 
suspected area. Um, I should note that for that particular area, we have public record uh, analysis uh, by former owners that identified uh, many of that, uh, much of the land in that area as what they referred to as, quote, poorly drained soils. And, you know, I'm not saying that's a wetland. I'm not saying that. Um, but I want to be sure that in our thinking through, you know, if we're looking at that parcel and trying it on for size, we're thinking about that kind of resource as well. Similarly, with respect to monarch overwintering sites on that site, I want to be sure that we have clarity on, on that question. Um, with respect to the view shed, um, the, you know, I was sort of trying to capture my notes as it went by. I hope that the picture also captured the view looking up towards the hills from the state beach, and it probably did because Brittany and Jill capture everything. But if it didn't, I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, and uh, let's see, those were my thoughts about uh, that specific example. Thank you again for bringing it up. With respect to uh, lot retirement and development rights, uh, transfer of de development rights, um, I will say for my own part that uh, I believe that if our densification is going to occur in the city, as we develop our programs for uh, managing the total number of entitlements in this city, I do not believe that the downtown area itself should be exempt from having to manage that because since that's where, it's sort of like the, the, uh, the nexus of the future development. It's gonna be where the impact generating development is going to occur. And if we're just nibbling at the edges where there's relatively little development occurring, I don't know how we're going to achieve the, the goals that we're trying to describe there. Um, once again, I'm not a wizard about uh, you know, what can work and what's legal with respect to um, you know, whether uh, TDRs or lot retirement can apply to different kinds of development. But if it, if it expands the amount of development that's occurring, we should be finding some way to reduce its impact, whatever that is. And I'm open in terms of method. I'm respectful of the insight that the uh, former executive directors had. I just want to be smart about it, and I want to be sure that we do not uh, leave things on the table that we need to keep. Um, let me reload and let the others speak. Commissioner Polga. Um, and, uh, maybe this is, uh, I don't know if the proper way is to do this through the chair, but <laughs> a question to follow up on, on your, your comments just now. It, are you referring solely to lot retirement or you, it, is this, because there were other, we, other ideas about, or other ways that um, there's a mitigation for whatever, for development, like the trap, you mentioned the traffic fee and, and so, is I, I guess I'm, are you referring solely to the idea, the concept of the the lot retirement? Is that my understanding? Well, I, I wasn't. Um, okay. I, my you know development has a lot of impacts. One of them is traffic, um, but you know uh, there can be other other impacts. There can be impacts on uh, infrastructure. Um, we can lose um, impermeable stuff, and we need to suddenly have more drainage. Um, and I, you know, again, I'm not arguing that I understand all of the, that I have a complete accounting of all of the different impacts and that I know for sure that, that these proposals never double count, nor am I saying that the proposals as they stand don't leave stuff uncounted. I don't know what they are, but I would hate to restrict our thinking to just lot retirement as a way of accounting for that. If going with lot retirement is the implication that we're gonna deal with just one specific problem. Did that make sense? Thank you. Do you have questions you want to follow up with? Or? Um, well, uh, I guess following on the, the law retirement, I, I was, uh, my understanding from the, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, currently the Coastal Commission um, does, has not, or uh, up to now, has not applied the law retirement, like a lot retirement requirement for multifamily like rental development and so 
I, th I think that's a good thing because I, I, I want to see, I think that the, uh, the incentive for, I realize it's a requirement, but I don't want to see it de-incentivized basically because there's a, you know, you're doing one-to-one -one for a development like that. Um, so I, I didn't, I just wanted to make sure that that was, I was accurate in that and I understood it correctly. Through the chair, I'd like to just respond. I'm not sure if we know if they, the full scope of lot retirement um, that they've applied in other jurisdictions. In Half Moon Bay, it's pretty limited because it's only really been projects where we had an appeal that went up into their jurisdiction, or we had applicants for various reasons who um, provided lot retirement as part of their um, application. And so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, a few projects in particular. So they were all land subdivisions and your sample size is really small. So we'll, we'll talk to their staff to see what else they've, they've done um, in terms of mid coast of course around here, but if there's any other uh, lot retirement. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Reddick. Yeah, thank you. Um, with respect to the Venice Beach example, which I thought was very helpful, uh, when when we think about the 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 guidelines that exist in the draft chapters at this point, to, to me, and I'm I'm echoing Commissioner Benjamin a little bit here and supporting him. Uh, to me, those guidelines make a lot of sense because they're, they're supportive of the very admirable goals in the sort of the mission statement of the plan, which is to create uh, holistic uh, uh, projects and that, 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 are, that exist as coherent neighborhoods. So to me, I always felt that those guidelines were in support of that you know, very positive goal there. Um, the, the question that, that former Mayor Ferrara raised just now about the role of all the property owners in a, in a, in a PD. I, I would hope and I would think that we're not here to invent that for the first time tonight or, or as part of the, this draft, but surely there must be precedent about that that, that that has existed in the city. Respond. Yeah, uh, please. Um, so, to the extent this is a legal question, my office has um, looked into some of these issues, and I think that the role for the individual property owner here is to participate. There will be ample notice and participation in the planning process, and there are particular policies in the draft LCP requiring that any master plan or specific plan that's presented make sure that there's no what we might call taking of an individual's property as a result of this. So there, it's part of a planning process. A specific plan itself is a legislative action. So that's something that you know the city itself could decide we want to come up with our own specific plan sure. for these individual areas. It's a planning process. It's a legislative process. Um, so, you know, obviously individual property owners play a role in that, but, uh, you know, one property owner is not going to have a veto power over the city in adopting a plan for an entire area. Uh, it's more being involved in the process um, as it goes forward. Okay. Do you want to cite to that? Your uh, zoning code right now for planned development land use is uh, 1815.020. Rezone, um, this is about rezoning to a planned unit development district, talks about uh, how we would uh, require notification of owners. Um, there's other uh, references in the code to how all owners are supposed to be offered um, participation, but it doesn't mean that they're an applicant. They don't have to be an applicant. Thank you for that. Um, my, I think my last comment is um, uh, in, in terms of TDRs, when we were discussing this in a little more detail, I think two meetings ago, I, th I think that I may have been 
uh, came across as a bit more skeptical about the untested waters there than I intended to be. I, I think that it'd be well worth trying, especially if it isn't too burdensome to the city and the staff to set up and administer such a program. I, I, I'm hoping and I'm guessing that wouldn't be too onerous, and, and in which case I think it would be uh, something that would be, that would be well worth trying to implement. And, and actually to piggyback off of um, Commissioner Ruddock's uh, comments, I, I think that um, I, I see the, in today in the, com in the presentation, um, I appreciated the uh, uh, understanding of how the, the TDRs as a, as a, at this policy level could apply and, and would, in that there's a lot more work that would go into developing this as a, for implementation. So I, I think in the past, in the two meetings ago, I, I was also kind of pretty, you know, skeptical or scared, I think is the exact word I use. I think that I, um, it's not that I don't have any concerns. I think though as a policy tool to have in the toolbox, I, I would see, I, I understand and, I, and I'm supportive of that. So I wouldn't want to see it go away. But um, more, it, I think there's a lot of um, once the implementation side of it comes, then I think that's where there's a lot of work to be done. But um, certainly as a policy level tool, I agree. Um, I did also, I, I have, I don't, don't want to change the subject, so if other, wants, other folks want to talk about TDRs. Okay, um, so I wanted to just, I, I really appreciated the, the example of the, the Venice Beach. Um, that was very helpful. I think I was probably one of those who's been raising lots of like, well, what are you gonna, are you gonna consider this? Are you gonna consider this, you know? And how does this play in? So I, it was very helpful. Um, I, I think that there are still a couple places where it isn't clear that um, uh, policies that are particularly, particularly in the natural resources um, chapter that really how, whether they really would apply to um, the, the, the master planning or specific planning process. And, and in particular, I think this applies with the um, stormwater. Um, and I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm gonna harp on it because <laughs> um, I see this a lot just in my work, how it can be a problem. So I think it's something that really should be baked in early on. And there are some policies in the natural resources section, um, I'm pretty sure, that um, I do think would bear further uh, reference in the, or, or they should be applied more specifically to the specific planning process because that at that early stage as opposed to when you're looking at a development of a specific building a resident residential unit or whatever that I think you really need it at a much earlier stage so I just wanted to reiterate it I know I'm kind of a broken record and I'm, I'm sorry about that um, I also do think that there's some opportunity to um, maybe uh, address some of the cumulative uh, disruption that can occur to habitat values and their long-term habitat protection and viability. This is from one of the um, policies in the natural resources section, um, and I think that that could be more explicitly brought in. And it may be that I didn't um, quite, that, that may already, you may have already talked about that tonight, and I may have just missed it. Um, and not seeing that um, policy mentioned. So I just wanted to bring that up because as when we're thinking about this develop this planning process and we're talking about like all the multiple landowners, I, I hear the the concern of not wanting to the, the other if the one landowner isn't participating or whatever, the other landowners can't do something that would be a takings. but sometimes the interests that and the reasons why someone is managing or owning a piece of a parcel vary. And so I'm not sure how takings applies to like the habitat value. Um, that's not an economic value necessarily, I don't know. So I would be interested in understanding that because I think that there's a lot of uh, parts of the planning process that could, uh, or th in developing a, a plan for an area, it could end up it essentially um, uh, harming the value that uh, one, you know, when we have, you know, uh, landowners who are, want to protect that land for habitat value, you know, so that could be a concern and it should be part of the planning process is looking at how that might happen. And so it kind of ties together. It's a, I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but I just would, I don't know if takings would actually cover that necessarily. 
Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know a lot. So it's just a question and a concern I have. Can I tag up? So, yeah. So uh, let me just riff off that a little bit. So, uh, well, I, I don't know. There was a lot there that you said that I agreed with. And if you're a broken record on uh, drainage concerns, uh, I can just say that I'm, I'm a broken gramophone. Um, but, but we have um, conservation qualities that are tied to a larger network of land. And if there's a parcel of land that has conservation value that is more expansive than that parcel, for example, that would be eliminated if it was conserved as kind of derisively, this is referred to as postage stamp conservation. And if I can in infer what she's describing, um, it might be the issue of, you know, in addition to whatever development might occur on that parcel, the value that that owner has is that owner's decision. And I think she's saying that it's that that needs to be respected. Um, Thank you. That was much better said. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. Um, with respect to um, drainage, um, I think another example that, although Venice does speak to it a little bit, I think another example that may be more compelling, especially in light of um, the recent rains we've had, is the breakup of North Wavecrest into Dolores and North, Wave, North Wavecrest? North Wavecrest Sub. Um, and I, you know, if you go down there, I went down there um, and I noticed how very damp it was uh, during the storm. Of course, it's winter that's going to happen. Dolores, right? But the question is, how does that water drain? What is, and uh, again, to sort of try to uh, see if I can put more, wrap more words around Sarah's much more succinct statement, you know, that if, if impermeable development occurs there, that water has to go somewhere. And I don't know if it's going to Seymour, which doesn't really need more water, or if it's going to get conserved in land that's further to the west and somehow percolate in. I, I just don't know. Or some, something else good happens to it, that's great. But if I understood her right, the goal is for us to understand that at the master planning phase as opposed to later. Is that it? Record shows yes, that was it. Um, I wanted to talk about fire, if I can switch the subject. Um, and I really appreciated uh, the feedback that you got from um, your presentations and the discussion from Cal Fire's marshal uh, or chief. And it reminded me of the situation that we run into in Half Moon Bay and in our LCP draft of this collision between parcels where someone wants to build really close to a wooded area and the idea that if they don't, they somehow have to build something smaller and they don't like that. So we end up making provisions in our LCP that say, well, you know, we're going to try to make it easy, but you really got to accept that there are limits. And we wrote that before we were fully cognizant of the size of the fire risk. And I am not confident that my understanding when I wrote that still bears up under the realities that we understand today. So I'd, I would certainly like staff to have a good look at it. You know, and it's not just that I want to conserve the, the wooded areas. I want to I keep that person safe. So if we have a lot that is very wide along, let's say, a wooded riparian corridor, but it's very thin, and we have a guy or an applicant, sorry, who says, I got, my house has to be built deep into that and it has to be really close to that riparian corridor. You know, we have provisions in our plan right now that say, well, okay, you can be closer. You know, there's a limit. I think it's 20 feet for intermittent streams. Um, not so much for, for perennials. But I think that we should be taking another look at that, you know, as, uh, uh, as Jill mentioned, I don't remember whether it was Brittany or Jill actually, uh, but fuel modification can be talking about house modification too. And if the house modification is a smaller house, you know, I, I'd like to think that that might not be takings. I'm not an expert. 
Um, but I think that now, knowing what we know now, I think we ought to take a good look at that and ask ourselves if we're acting in the community's best interest. And when we anticipate projects where we have an existing neighborhood uh, that is close to a wooded area, if we have opportunities to make it safer through modification, and again, I'm not talking about that as a code word for habitat destruction, I think we ought to be, find ways to encourage that, um, because uh, especially in areas where they're going to burn hot, but really next to all highly, uh, highly flammable areas. Thanks. Thank you, and um, I'm just going to, I guess, build off of the fire concern there. I actually, I, this weekend, I, I had my, uh, I was up in Quarry Park while, while my kid was at a, at a play date in, in El Granada, and, uh, and actually had to leave Quarry Park earlier because uh, the traffic coming out of El Granada on Saturday was just insane. I've never seen it that bad, and everybody jamming up to get through um, to Highway 1, taking all the different little back routes and all this sort of stuff. And yeah, I was really struck by if there was a fire in Quarry Park um, and everybody trying to get out of that area would be an absolute nightmare. So um, so yeah, it's something to think about just in terms of, you know, when Hindi Highway 92 is backed up and potential fires within the eucalyptus groves around 92, um, just a lot of really sensitive areas. So that's why I think it's really, um, it's really important to consider um, climate resiliency in all of these chapters um, and, and in the development chapter and as we're talking about you know any of the areas along Highway 1 and the potential for you know big vehicles or other things that could potentially clog that corridor that could have those ripple effects that block up 92 or El Granada is uh, um, it's it's you know it's I'm concerned about habitat issues as well but it's a life and safety issue um, certainly um, so I think that's good. With regards, I really appreciated the, the Venice Beach example, as did others, you know, walking through. I don't necessarily think it's too specific. I think it provides some really good book bookends and some really uh, good guidance uh, for landowners to really understand what the, what the goals and expectations are. Um, I think, and I think I heard from staff that um, there will be more information forthcoming on lot retirement and the need to look at that. Um, you know, we heard some heard some different things, and I think still just you know better understanding some of the questions that were raised here about one for one, uh, the downtown core. Um, I think I think I tend I tend to agree that um, that the downtown shouldn't uh, be exempt. That we don't uh, want to take away that development opportunity, but also you know very interested in seeing the you know, incentivizing multifamily and affordable housing uh, in downtown. So, um, so as Sarah mentioned, if it's, if it's not required for, for multifamily units, then that, then that may just not be an issue. Um, sort of a personal interest here, but the Sweetwood group camp was mentioned. I think it is really important to acknowledge how special of a, a, a coastal access feature that is. Um, I, can, I can think of few places on the coast that you can have that group camp experience within uh, a relatively urban area as ours um, and really feel like you're very much away from, from everything there. So I know my family and friends utilize it often and, and, uh, and I think it's just a really unique resource. Um, regarding the uh, participation of different landowners within the specific plan and, and that sort of thing, I think you know, obviously I understand a city could come in and do a specific plan for, for any particular area and not necessarily have the agreement or the buy-in of every landowner. Um, but as a decision maker, I think that's really important information to, to have um, as we're making decisions, understanding the different positions of landowners in there. I don't know how we capture that in a plan, that, um, but I would hope as future applications are considered, um, there's some level of dialogue or or consideration that's uh, captured in there about um, just the position of landowners within the specific land areas, um, and uh, and that that's um, that's on the public record. Um, 
And just I guess one, uh, just I, I know the answer to this, but there was a question raised by one of the speakers tonight about the correspondence that the Planning Commission receives and that that be made available. That's all on the public record, correct? That's um, that's available and accessible to folks. So so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, so with that, that's all my comments. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin. Thanks. There was one more, uh, again, on the Venice Beach trying it out for a size thing. When we got to the uh, hazard side, I wanted to, I, it didn't specifically come up, and that may be that it was just was too much of a detail, um, or it may be that it just got lost. But a couple, back in January, I remember making a kind of a bank shot, maybe a hyperbolic bank shot, uh, about uh, having addressable hazards uh, warning systems. And the idea is that in a place like Frenchman's Creek, the creek could flood, fire could come down from the hills, tsunami could come up, there could be fire coming, you know, from a different direction. And it makes sense to me that when we plan a place like that, we would want to be sure that instead of just having a one-size-fits-all siren where you get to guess whether this matters and what you should do, you get a system that says these are the people that, sh that really have a life emerging need to occupy the extremely scarce resource of our evacuation route. And that way, we don't panic people to say, well, just in case, I guess I better get on, on the road and go somewhere and maybe, dr you know, deprive someone who really needs to get out or worse, put themselves in harm's way. So I'm just going to put a plug in for that to be in the list of ways that. Um, that the way things would play out in the Venice Beach PD. And um, I hope that makes sense. I hope it sounds familiar. Commissioner Polgar. And I'll just note, we do have one other item on the agenda that I know staff wants to get through, so. This is super, super quick. I realize I never, um, the one, one thing I did want to mention is that I also felt like the specificity was, was appropriate for, the, you know, in the example you gave. So I just wanted to be on the record to, you know, say that I felt like that fit. It was a good balance. Um, and so I, I think I, I just forgot to say that. So. Great. So with that, there's no other, uh, no other comments. Um, we'll go ahead and close that study session and move on to our next item, which is an acknowledgement of emergency coastal development permit. I'm sorry, Jill, you have next steps and you have additional items. Yes. Feel yes. free. Thank you. We need a break. Um, over here, we need we need to take a month off at least oh, to uh, finish. Uh, we we owe you a few things, and uh, keeping up with this pace, with all the development applications we have, and you have a full agenda. Um, you're booked through May, at least. Uh, so I just we talked to uh, the subcommittee met last Friday. We discussed it. I think we have their support and. We will not waste the time, believe me. So I just wanted to let you know, and we'll be very splashy with notice the next time we come out. We may be shifting to the first meeting of the month. That was uh, something that we also talked about if it worked better for um, schedules. So just FYI, what you've given us uh, today was incredibly helpful. So um, we're. I think we're in firm footing. Um, Commissioner Benjamin, uh, Vice Chair Benjamin, I, we have that comment from you, and I cannot find, there's, there, maybe we missed that policy. We thought that um, emergency warning system policy was in here. We will look for it. There's an appropriate place for it, and it could be a, it, it's so general that I don't know that it's a PD-specific policy from my perspective. So we'll take a, a gander through and see where it might go and share that with you. Yeah, through the chair. I didn't mean to suggest that it had to be PD. It may be a factorable policy. It may be one of the general policies in the safety, uh, the coastal hazard section. So I defer to you about where, where it goes. She's going to look in another chapter while we move on to the next item. So uh, 
we wanted to um, bring your attention to uh, issuance of an emergency coastal development permit. Uh, this is the coastal development permit for the temporary fencing along Poplar Beach. Uh, the city engineer and public works director presented this to city council a week ago and they wanted to uh, make sure that we took every opportunity to make sure the public is aware of what this is and why the city's doing it. And um, I also wanted to confirm with the commission, and this is something that wasn't clear in the report, that uh, the follow-up action here is uh, going to be the Poplar Gateways plan. And uh, the Public Works Director and I discussed this. We, we can actually make an application for a coastal development permit for the Poplar Gateways plan. We have 60 days to do that from the issuance of this permit. The fencing is going to need to be uh, flexible. You're going to need, we're going to have to put up with it a little bit. It may need to move around from time to time. Um, we are very actively planning that area right now with that gateways plan. So um, we know people don't like it, and we know it doesn't look great, but I think, I think frankly, this might be a good public education period to see why it's there, what its purpose is, and um, hopefully to reinforce what, what the city is trying to do with the Poplar Gateways plan. So uh, just so you know, uh, the rest of this, we, would, we just confirmed the Coastal Commission staff has the permit. Uh, we followed all the procedures in the emergency coastal development permit issuance that we are required to do. And all we ever ask the Planning Commission to do is just acknowledge that you've received it. This is something that's codified that we, we bring it to you in your next available meeting. This was issued after your agenda went out, which is why we revised your agenda. We didn't need to do that. Um, I could have brought it up in my um, director's report. We did that intentionally to get the thing emailed out yet again, just to make sure everyone had a chance to hear about it and understand. This was put on e-news, this was posted on next door. So if you hear anybody who's concerned about it and, and you think that it would benefit them to talk to staff, uh, steer them over to us and we're, ha we're happy to work with the community on this really important issue. So Jill, just so we're abundantly clear, this is temporary yep. and there is going to be a, a more permanent project that's installed. Um, and sort of building off your comment on using this as an opportunity to communicate with the public, um, is staff talking about any signage plans or any interpretation or anything that can be done around uh, bluff top erosion and, and that type of thing? We, we think we should have some signage out there um, in this interim phase. The Poplar Gateways plan will definitely have interpretive, um, permanent, high quality, very educational signage and it will have, we, we anticipate it would have graphics, it would um, make relationships between uh, the restoration that we would expect that plan to include as well as uh, erosion mitigation and um, public access, etc. So there's, it's rich with opportunity to have um, a great new experience for learning about the coastal terrace in that area. So just so I don't miss the opportunity to just uh, pounce on one of my pet peeves is um, the guy from one of the, the horse riding facilities on his uh, Segway who rides up and down the bluff tops uh, very close on the areas that would be closed. Um, I know we've mentioned this before. I don't understand how it's any different than, you know, a motorcycle running along the bluff tops or anything else up there. Um, and um, it's a motor vehicle, you know, running along there. Um, been doing it for years, and, and so I don't know um, if anything's ever been done to try to address that. But A number of things are being worked on, and we can report back to you on that at a future meeting. Yep. Okay. Can I ask a question related to that? Um, is the intent to build any new fencing between now and when the trail is relocated as part of the bigger Poplar Gateways? project? 
We need to find out what the Poplar Gateways plan is going to include and the phasing of it. We anticipate needing to uh, address bluff erosion first and foremost in, in advance of retreating the trail and implementing um, a variety of uh, components which could include split rail fencing, enhanced coastal terrace prairie landscaping, um, focused areas where lookouts could be um, safely provided so that uh, folks aren't tempted to hop the fence or trudge through um, the habitat restoration areas. There's a, there's a whole um, gamut of things that we're considering, and so uh, it segues into the director's report, which is that the very next thing we're doing on the Gateways Plan is going to be a Parks and Recreation Committee or Commission um, hosting a workshop on uh, Wednesday, April 24th. That's their next meeting, and it will be for Poplar Gateways with alternatives and we've been making uh, a lot of progress on that and we're ready to get feedback on choices so that plan is going to come knit together pretty quickly uh, is part of the uh for this um permit ish, uh, this emergency with the fencing is is because currently there, I don't know where it's going with respect to the benches that are out there. So I, I, I the part of the reason, I mean, people, if there's a bench out there, it pretty much Im implies that, and logically so, that you're supposed to go out there. So I was wondering, how does this relate to, are the benches going to be removed? And then another question is that um, now, you know, people are trying to go down where the horses are going down further up. And so they don't want to walk because it's like full of, horse poop, so they don't want to walk down that part, so they're walking down other parts. Is the fencing going to be used to kind of block off some of the casual trails that are more and more forming down to the, the beach, kind of north of Poplar, between Poplar and Kelly, but north of Poplar Beach? There's oh so much that we want to get into on this. Um, the fencing at this point in time has one key priority, is to keep people safe. Um, we're really concerned. The active erosion, you, um, Commissioner Ruddick sent us some pictures. I went out that same weekend with our landscape architect and we, we documented a lot, including the Segway photographer. And uh, we, we have a lot of information about this. We will, uh, the fencing will not block the two pieces, uh, co vertical coastal access points, the one at Poplar and the one we call the slot which is where the horses go. Uh, there may be locations where the fencing is east of a bench. There may be other locations where it's going to be west of the bench. Some of the benches are just a lot closer. We're trying to figure out how to work with the benches in the long range plan. They're really important to the community, um, but we note significant pools of water under most of the benches and it's it's a real concern and and so they may need to be um, brought in board of the trail so there's that's a consideration that you'll see at the workshop we have a lot of things to think about and a lot of uh, sensitive uh, topics this is um, a precious resource for half Moon bay we, under we understand that Mr. Benjamin? Yeah, I know this is a tactless pun, but let me just ask whether we can segue to these concerns in other areas. I was up at the uh, overlook at the edge of Wave, and I've noticed significant erosion in that area. I haven't been down to the Poplar site, so I can't compare them, and I'm not discounting how significant it must be. But, and I, further, I realize that there are a lot of people there because there's a parking lot there. So the hazard, just in terms of the sheer number of people who are at risk, is higher than in a, a place like this that, actually that's not true, there's a big parking lot at Venice. So we have a parking lot problem here too. So my question is, uh, is it, would it make sense to sort of briefly survey the erosion in other places, maybe do a photo document and then look at it again to see whether this is a problem elsewhere or if this is really the spot and everything else is sort of uh, a distant second cousin. 
I will pass that on to the city engineer. Our focus on Poplar is it's the city's responsibility. It's high bluff. People s go right out to the precipice of it. And I'm um, not sure if WAVE has that same risk, safety risk, So, um, because I'm not quite sure if I know the location you're talking about. So maybe we can talk about that after the meeting. Um, but there's multiple ownerships along the way. State Parks has a, a large area of responsibility, which I, is probably the area you're, t you're noting. Um, we we need to take care of this this space um, on behalf of the city, but I will certainly pass that on. And if you see the erosion, send us the pictures. We we are um, giving them right now to um, you, you, Brittany. You met with the geologist. We have a a little uh, inventory that we've been doing and passing it on to a state group that has been studying our erosion and we're we're getting quite involved in that so similar to how we got all our bio studies together we're trying to find every single old geotech study that we've ever done and and move it on to them so um just another layer of of half moon bay so we'll crowdsource yeah. you a few pictures yes <laughs> go easy yeah, on it <laughs> we're coming right up on 10 30. So yep. and we can quick. do this yep I asked that question because I think the city has done exactly the right thing with the temporary fencing out there in interests of public safety. Some people think it's unesthetic, but I think it's a good, I think it's necessary and it's okay if people understand what's happening with erosion there. But I, I hope we wouldn't rush into building split rail fence that may be abandoned in 12 months or 18 months when the trail is relocated. That's a good point. Okay. With that, uh, moving on to the next item, which I believe is the planning director's report. You don't need any formal action on this. This is just no, an No, you've heard it. You clearly discussed it. <laughs> um, thank you for supporting that. Um, Brittany found the policy. We don't like where it is. We'll, we'll send you an email. And um, it's in there. Seven. Yeah, seven dash 42 page 7-31 in the coastal hazards chapter. Okay, uh, you have, a, a, a few of you have signed up for the April 30th, uh, Designing Our Future Current Issues in Housing Training that's being offered by uh, 21 Elements Home for All and uh, Northern California uh, APA. If you're interested, um, and you haven't signed up, let us know, and we will get you in there. I, I, about, I think three of you went to their first session. It was a very broad uh, planning commission introduction session. This is going to focus on housing. Uh, please let Bridget know over for the next few meetings if you're not going to be able to attend. We know Commissioner Benjamin is not able to attend the next session. And we really need to, once we're down one, we got to see where we are with quorum and um, keep us posted because we've got, uh, we've already noticed items for that, for that day. And jumping into the uh, agenda forecast, April 9th, uh, you will have 2,800 champs lise This was um, a proposal for a new single family home in the new Stolowski gonzalez plan development. And then a restroom at Ocean View Park. Uh, there are actually four uh, projects, small projects in downtown that are simmering and going to come to you um, that include housing in one way or another. Uh, the Bike Works pr proposal that you saw in study session, there's a um, conversion of a house at 700 Main Street. 631 Mill Street is a new uh, proposal and then um, there's a, a garage house thing going on at 623 Church. So it's really interesting that it's just a, a little cluster of things, and you'll probably end up seeing a couple of them together, and it'll, it'll be interesting to get your feedback because this is in our town center area and just to see how it's kind of relating to your, your policy document. I am going to have a whole bunch of director items, but none of them are scheduled quite yet. They're just stacking up. Today, the City Council had their priority setting session. Commissioner Reddick was there. Um, council uh, 
shook out five priorities. Uh, they were affordable housing, in particular looking for options to getting a project going. They had two different approaches to it and they were open about each. The second was a really comprehensive um, look at emergency preparedness. The third one was transportation demand management. Um, examples of that were um, ride sharing, park and ride lot, complete streets projects. Uh, sustainability was the fourth and uh, some of the ideas there included um, getting the city facilities to be um, carbon neutral, zero net energy types of um, operation at, in a period of time. Uh, dealing with plastic waste and uh, getting a community garden. And then the fifth one was uh, working on a minimum wage ordinance. So those were the five. Um, what the city manager has promised to do is come back to council in, I think, May with um, our staff recommended work plans um, under each of those five um, kind of high level categories. So uh, we expected affordable housing. You're going to see things come through the commission um, to that end. So um, at council's last meeting on March 19th, they uh, directed staff to proceed. Uh, we, we presented them with a proposal for establishing an architectural advisory committee we are um, going ahead and doing that. That was something that the Planning Commission has asked for. It took us some time to get, get to it, and uh, we're looking towards having a three-member advisory committee, not a review committee. Uh, we were very specific in the recommendation to Council that the scope of the Architectural Advisory Committee will be uh, not an entitlement body. Planning Commission is the primary land use entitlement body for the city. We're going to be really careful with the scope and the boundaries and um, how the flow of the process works. I've been a liaison to an architectural review committee for 13 years, so I've done this gig before, so I'm going to be really um, careful with it, but I also want to tell you I'm, I welcome it. I'm really looking forward to it because we need that depth, and I think it's going to be great for the projects that that come to the commission. Uh, the housing element annual report went through council at their meeting last week as well, and we're going to get it up to HCD this week. It's due April 1st, so we're, we're fine. And then I've already announced the Poplar Gateways meeting, um, the workshop in the end of April. And uh, of course the commission is, is welcome to tuck into that if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, moving on to, I Planning Commissioner Communications? I, I'll just say that I went to the Yosemite Leadership Conference. Uh, very, it was a great um, report um, of conditions across the state. Very inspirational, good connections. Any additional? Anybody have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor, we're adjourned. Aye. Yes. Emergency preparedness. Uh, sustainability, not sustainable development, sustainability. So like plastics, community garden, the other one, I can't remember what the other one was. Um, and more minimum wage, affordable housing, emergency There was a fifth one. There are five, I can't remember. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Better than I had.